political science at Iona College, and Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital. Rick Davis has won many political campaigns, including that of John McCain for President of the United States. So, Rick, let me start with you, if I may. If you're advising President Trump, what is the one thing he has to do tonight, and what is the one thing he must not do tonight? Well, I think the very first thing that he has to do is regain his position with those suburban women who voted for him in 2016 and abandoned the Republican Party in 2018. So ironically, he needs to talk to Republicans tonight and he needs to give them the confidence that he can be presidential and that he can address this coronavirus. If he doesn't, he runs the risk of disconnecting with those voters. He's already disconnected with them on many other issues, but he can't afford to miss this opportunity tonight. So that's the front opportunity. What's he got to avoid doing? Well, I think he's got to avoid looking like a bully. Uh, Uncle Joe Biden is a figure who is loved by many, and he's seen as a empathetic uh, guy who stands up for the little guy. And if he looks like he's bullying Uncle Joe, it could backfire on him pretty badly tonight. Okay, Jenny, what does Uncle Joe have to do? What's the one thing he has to do? What is the one thing he has to avoid? I think wh what he has to do is he has to have a debate like he had with Paul Ryan. He has been very good, and I think Paul Ryan, he was at his best in these one-on-one -on -one debates. I think he has to avoid having a debate like we saw with the multi-candidate debates this primary season, where he looked like he was stumbling, couldn't remember certain things, lost track of time, because that falls right into the trap that the president has set for him. And I do think he is up to the task, but we'll have to see. So, so one of the things we've seen before from President Trump is he has a tendency to break down the structure of the debate. I mean, he will interrupt. He will uh, actually, last time with Hillary Clinton, he actually moved around the stage. Uh, does Chris Wallace have to confine that or does Joe Biden have to counter that? What do you do about that? Well, it's really Chris Wallace's job. And Chris Wallace has set the tone. He said, I'm going to appear invisible in this debate. He's not going to be a fact checker. He's not going to try and discipline the candidates. The program is actually created in order to get interchange between the candidates. Two minutes apiece on each issue and then 10 minutes to go at each other. And so I bet Chris Wallace loses control of this debate within the first question. Well, that'll make it fun to watch at least. Gee, I'm not sure it'll be fun for <laughs> Joe Biden because I'm not sure how he handles that as a practical What's the biggest issue tonight? I think the biggest issue, bar none, is the pandemic health care. You mentioned it. This is a historic moment. We've never had a presidential debate or election during a pandemic. This is a debate without an audience, you know, just a few people. This is a debate where they're not going to shake hands. They're going to be socially distanced. Joe Biden may come out with a mask to make it the case, right? And so I do think that for particularly Joe Biden, but all Americans, this is about health care. And that closely ties into the economy and, of course, the Supreme Court, because both of those things have been impacted and are impacted by health care. Okay, Rick and Jeannie, I'm delighted to say we'll be staying with us throughout the evening. In the meantime, we want to go out to Cleveland to our chief Washington correspondent. He is Kevin's really, he's on the spot, has been. So, Kevin, give us a sense of what's going on in the immediate lead up to this debate. Well, 90 minutes, but there's no spin room. And in fact, this is the first socially distant presidential debate in history. And as a result of that, most of the reporters having to be housed outside of the Cleveland Clinic behind me where the debate is set to begin underway. All day long, top surrogates for both campaigns making their way out to talk with the reporters. I just spoke with Senator Marsha Blackburn, as well as Mark Meadows, the president's chief of staff. They said that they traveled with the president on Air Force One. He's fired up. He's in good spirits. He was joking with Rudy Giuliani and that they feel this is an opportunity to bulldoze through something that has largely eclipsed them in the first part of this campaign, which has been how the president has handled the coronavirus and the pandemic. They're hoping that they can utilize this first presidential debate to have the president tell his side of the story to make some inroads on that front. In contrast, the Democrats, I've spoken with some top Democrat surrogates, including some of the more centrist Democrats in the party, including Congressman Connor Lamb. He's a Republican from southwestern Pennsylvania. He flipped a Republican district that President Trump carried in 2016. I asked him, what did you do that Hillary Clinton didn't do? He said he talked about the economy and pensions, and that he's hoping that Joe Biden will do that. Now, emboldened by some battle great, battleground state polls, Joe Biden's leading, according to Washington Post, ABC News in Pennsylvania, by 10 percentage points. And according to a Marist poll that just came out this afternoon, he's up by 10 in Wisconsin. Jim Jordan doesn't believe those polls, but, you know, it's political season, so those polls now 
are just uh, the latest back and forth ping pong in politics. Well, and we all love the polls, even if we all know that we've been burned by them <laughs> from time to time. But as a yeah. practical matter, overwhelmingly, President Trump has been shown as trailing Vice President Biden in the polls. Does that put more uh, pressure on President Trump tonight? Because he has to change people's minds. If Joe Biden comes out of this still on top, he's in good shape. You know, and I put that question to a senior advisor on the president's re-election campaign, Kimberly Guilfoyle. I said, is this a turnout election or is this a, a trying to find those very few tens of thousands of undecided voters uh, who make up the electorate? And she said it's a mixture of both. Uh, and so this, for as much as uh, the pundits like to say that debates don't matter, David, you and I both know that they still very much matter. Because should one of the nom should nominee Biden or President Trump flop tonight, then you lose um, a, a week's worth of news cycles, uh, and it really could change the momentum and the narrative for one of the campaigns. Yeah, when well, you're coming close to just four weeks left, losing a week is really painful, no question about it. Many thanks to Bloomberg Chief Washington Correspondent Kevin Shirley, who will be with us through the evening as well. Coming up, the battle over the Supreme Court will be one of the issues on the agenda tonight. We'll take a look at that and at the history of presidential debates with Professor Barbara Perry of the University of Virginia. This is coverage of the first presidential debate on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Special coverage of the first presidential debate on Bloomberg Television and on radio. I'm David Weston. President Trump's move to appoint a successor to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg before the election will be one of the contentious issues tonight at the debate. Bring us up to speed on that nomination, the nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett. Welcome now, Bloomberg Supreme Court reporter Greg Storr. So, Greg, thank you for being with us. Give us a sense of where that nomination sits right now. Are they moving forward to hearings and when? Uh, hearings are supposed to start October 12th. Uh, this is all happening in a very compressed time frame. Just today, uh, she submitted her questionnaire to the Senate Judiciary Committee. She's already meeting with senators. All this is stuff that would happen over the course of weeks, but now it's happening in a very short time span. And is there any question but that she'll get confirmed as a practical matter? No, not unless there's a, a huge surprise. Uh, no reason to think that with Republicans controlling the Senate uh, with 53 votes. Uh, it, it seems uh, very likely she will have the votes to get confirmed, uh, and it could even happen before the election. So how quickly could she be actually be on the court, and what does that mean in terms of what cases she might be sitting on? Yeah, it, it could be Republicans are trying to get her onto the court uh, before the, the election. If that happens, she could be on the court when they hear arguments on the Affordable Care Act a week after the election. Uh, even if she's not on the court, she could still take part in the case. They could re-argue it later when she's there. They might do that if, for example, she needed to break a 4 full tie. Uh, but there's a chance she will actually be there sitting to hear the case. So at this point, Greg, from where you sit, what is the objection of Democrats? I mean, I, I dare say it's hard to argue with her credentials. Her credentials are very, very strong by any measurement. And, and certainly the attempts to sort of raise questions about her Catholicism have backfired in Democrats. So what do they have left? 
Yeah, they, they are mostly going on the shift on the court overall, not on her personally. Uh, they don't see a whole lot of mileage to be uh, gained from going after her individually. You're right, she uh, seems very qualified. Uh, and uh, so they're talking about things like the Affordable Care Act. That's something where they think they can score political points and where her vote uh, potentially could make a difference. Okay, thank you so much. Always a treat to have you with us. That's our Bloomberg Supreme Court reporter, Greg Storr. For an historical perspective on the battle of the Supreme Court, we welcome now Barbara Perry. She's University of Virginia professor and director of presidential studies at the Miller Center. And she's also a former judicial fellow at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, our Bloomberg contributors, Gene Zano and Rick Davis, are still with us. So, Professor, thank you so much for being with us. Give us an historical perspective. Uh, is there really precedent for this sort of a really high-profile, very contentious appointment to the Supreme Court on the eve of a presidential election? No, David, not, not really. Uh, there, there is not. Um, most of the time, um, presidents have, have held off. Uh, they give the example particularly of Lincoln holding off before the 1864 election uh, when a, an opening came up. Although I did go back when Justice Scalia uh, passed uh, to see the entire history of court appointments and discovered that there were even some lame duck presidents, literal lame ducks who had lost the election uh, or they weren't running again, uh, and that they would actually appoint after after an election. But remember, there was a, a long, longer time frame between the elections and when uh, we had presidents inaugurated uh, in March uh, up until 1937 when the constitutional amendment changed that. Uh, but I, I would say in the modern era, in the contemporary era, this is pretty unusual. Well, you said something very important on the modern era, because as an historian, it's particularly cha challenging because the confirmation process for a Supreme Court justice is very different today than it was a generation ago. I clicked for Justice Powell a long time ago. I think that his confirmation hearing took one hour, and he could have been controversial today. It's very different today. Yeah, you're so true. Well, first of all, congratulations for being a Supreme Court clerk and for one of my favorites, Justice Powell from Richmond, just down the road here from Charlottesville. And um, I was able to interview him uh, when I was doing my dissertation. Just a lovely gentleman. Um, but yeah, so different. And even really up until the 1920s, there weren't hearings. Uh, and that really didn't become uh, common until the 1950s. So yes, you do, if you're looking back through the history, you have to point out uh, that there have been many changes, including uh, even as recently as Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer, they were really the last two uh, bipartisan votes. So they got uh, you know over 90 votes, Republicans and Democrats. Even Ted Kennedy uh, voted in about 20 Supreme Court nominations and for half of them, he voted for Republicans. But Sometime after the, the Breyer uh, nomination, we really went into this polarization. So now you see extreme polarization uh, in the appointments and the nominations and the battles uh, and, and in the votes. Professor Perry, it's Jeannie Zeno, and I wanted to just expand out a little bit to talk about what we're going to be hearing tonight in a few minutes during the debate and, you know, having used some of your work in the classroom, it's such a delight to talk to you. you when you look at what oh, we're... Thanks, yeah, when you look at the moment we're in and the fact that this so many issues going on from the nomination to COVID and the pandemic and the economy. And yet the electorate seems remarkably stable. We've seen very little movement in the polls. Historically, do you ever remember a moment like this 30, 40 days out of a presidential election? So many issues and yet so little seeming movement in the electorate? Well, I do think, Jeannie, that this is part and parcel of polarization, isn't it? And, and I, I actually am a trained political scientist rather than historian, so you and I are on the same page. Uh, and, and that's what we're seeing. We're, we're seeing that people get locked in uh, and they stay locked in. Um, we have had, I, I think of, for example, 1996 um, and Bill Clinton running against Bob Dole. I, I don't think there was much question that that Bill Clinton would would win that race. And so, you know, we or Mondale and, and Reagan. Uh, the first debate, uh, Reagan didn't do so well, so there might have been some questions. But he ended up winning by a landslide. And it wasn't so much polarization, but that people had just made up their minds and they were going to vote for Ronald Reagan. And again, he won in a landslide. So I do think, though, that this polarization now. I, I can hardly believe that anybody is undecided. And I heard someone a pundit say tonight, maybe these so-called undecided votes, I've heard voters, I've heard anything from 6 to 10 percent of the electorate still undecided. One pundit said, maybe they're just undecided as to whether they will vote. 
uh, or not. Not not that they will. Are, are we going to vote for Trump or are they going to vote for Biden? That that may be a possibility that there'll just be people who stay home. Hi, Professor Perry. This is Rick Davis in Washington, and uh, thank you for being on the show tonight. I, I want to get back to the Supreme Court. I mean, we know that. Uh, the new nominee has an outspoken track record on reproductive rights, and uh, the Republicans are pushing her for, for one of those primary reasons. Uh, but does the Roberts court want to weigh into overturning a president like Roe v. Wade at this stage of his uh, career? Well, such a good question, Rick. And we know that Chief Justice John Roberts, from the very beginning, one of the earliest interviews he did after coming on the bench, as Chief Justice in 2005, uh, he talked about the court as an institution. And in fact, he asked, speaking of Richmond, Virginia, he asked that uh, someone go to Richmond, Virginia and bring the robe of Chief Justice John Marshall, the fourth Chief Justice, but he's called the great Chief Justice of the United States, bring that to Washington uh, for the chief, new Chief Justice to wear. So he cares about the court as an institution. I think that's one of the reasons he voted to uphold the ACA. Uh, and I think you're right. He will have qualms, but he'll also be torn because he is a very uh, conservative Catholic. Uh, he and his wife adopted two children. They feel very strongly about, I think, um, the rights of a, of a baby, an unborn baby, the rights of a fetus. So I think he's going to really be torn between his religion and wanting to uphold the institution of the court. And part of that institution is upholding precedent. It, it helps to create the legitimacy and the authority of the court. But the other element is it helps to create stability in the law. And Justice O'Connor, though a fairly conservative Republican, always voted for uh, abortion. She used to say, you have generations of Americans who are living their lives, men and women, knowing that there is access to abortion. Uh, Professor, uh, we're about a little over 10 minutes now away from this debate to begin. Give us a perspective as a political scientist. Why do we care about these debates? Do they make a difference? Should they make a difference? What's their role in this process? Sure. Well, I just had the opportunity on Sunday to do a retrospective for an hour with C-SPAN on the 1960, the so-called Great Debates, the first presidential debates ever, and obviously the first ones ever shown on television. And they did make a difference, uh, particularly the first one with Kennedy and Nixon. And everybody probably knows that story of Kennedy looking the part, looking presidential, confident, uh, dressed well, had the right makeup, and then Nixon, who was ill and did not have the right makeup and wore the wrong suit uh, and just was a little bit uh, lacking in confidence, uh, just did not do well. And so that was a close race. We know all the way to the end, Kennedy in the end won the popular vote by only one-tenth of a percentage point. So any bit that he was able to gain, and we think he gained about three percentage points in the polls after that first debate, in some ways, Nixon really never made it up, even though he performed well in the three remaining debate. So yes, it can matter. Uh, or it can sort of lock in, as I mentioned, 1996 Bill Clinton and Bob Dole. I think that pretty much locked in uh, the reelection for Bill Clinton because he was a master uh, at all formats on television, but particularly the, the town hall. And he also, I think, won the 1992 debate. Uh, and I think George H.W. Bush lost the election in 1992 in part because of that town hall debate format that he just wasn't as good at as Bill Clinton, who could feel everyone's pain. <laughs> and, and Professor Perry, what's the one thing you would tell your students tonight that they should be watching out for in this debate between these two, these two gentlemen? I guess I would say, Jeannie, I would look out for uh, basic personality traits. I think Americans, you know, we used to say they, they want to think about a president as coming into their living rooms every night for the next, uh, the next four years. Uh, have people grown tired of the persona of Donald Trump coming into their living rooms, or now we would say, you know, popping up on their phones and, and tweeting at them? Uh, are they, do they want to sign up for another four years of that? And then likewise, going back to Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe Biden, uh, he seems to have that kind of persona that if people are seeing him in a, an avuncular way, um, that they want him to come into their homes. And especially during COVID, well, they may want him to wear a mask if he comes into their homes, but they feel confident that he can lead us through this pandemic. So I'd say look for their personalities, uh, obviously look for facts and figures, and let's look to see if Trump is going to be the bully. Maybe that's wearing thin with people. It, it worked with Hillary and against Hillary, but it might not work against Joe, and people might be growing tired of it. And for Joe, he's got to be fluent. 
He's got to be on his toes and he's got to be fluent. Professor Perry, a little bit on the tr uh, technology that we're going to see tonight. As you mentioned, in 1960, the new technology was television, and uh, Kennedy took great advantage of that. Some even say that Nixon won the radio audience. He was a good radio candidate. Well, this president, President Trump, is a great <laughs> social media candidate, and I'm wondering, do you see an interesting replay of the effect where tonight the 100 million people or so who watch this presidential debate We'll see one debate, and then tomorrow, the next day, and the rest of the campaign, they will see much different versions of this debate on social media. That's a really interesting point, Rick. And yes, uh, there there is that. I think it's actually an urban legend about uh, people who listened to the debate in 1960, the first debate, thought Nixon had won, uh, in part because there just wasn't enough uh, polling that was done of people who watched uh, the debate versus those who listened on radio. But uh, I encourage people to go to YouTube and, and take that experiment, and they could use that experiment tonight, watch it, and then listen to it. In the case of Kennedy and Nixon, Nixon had a great broadcast voice. Kennedy had that rather reedy and, and to the American ear, a bit of an odd Boston accent. Uh, for Trump, I think you're right. I mean, he reality TV star. He obviously is used to television, but so is Joe Biden. He's been doing this for 40 years. Um, so it's, it just depends on how people want to see it. What they didn't have in 1960 was they didn't have spin rooms. And they obviously didn't have social media. So yes, depending on what people are seeing on social media, what they're hearing from the spin doctors, and what Trump himself is tweeting out. He is the master of social media, as Kennedy was the master of the new medium of television, and FDR was the master of the new medium of radio. Uh, Professor Perry, I, I want to come back once again to the Kennedy-Nixon debate in this sense, because it was clear that uh, who became President Kennedy looked much better, looked the part more. And one might think that that's somewhat superficial, but I once had Dick Gebhardt, when he was running for president, say to me, you know what, it's like a job interview. And when you interview somebody for the job, it's not so much how they answer every single thing that might happen, because you don't know what will happen. It's more getting a sense of the person. So is there something valuable in our being able to look at these people as they interact with each other and measure the man? They're both men in this instance. Professor Perry, can you hear me? Uh, Dave, I've just, I've just lost your sound, but I did hear that last question, which was, you know, is, is there something about these personas and how they look and how they behave on the stage? Uh, I think that's crucial. Uh, obviously, television is a visual medium, and uh, it's also an audio one, too. So if we, we've lost uh, uh, audio here on this end, uh, we may have to end. But it, it is the case that Kennedy was really, really good at that. He looked directly into the camera. Nixon's eye, he, he, Nixon had the unfortunate uh, dark, beady eyes, and he was darting around. He had not uh, mastered television, even though he had done really well in 1952 with the checker speech. But he just, even though, and also he was a great debater. He had won debate contests in, in college, but he just wasn't up to the level that Kennedy was. And we should also remember that not only had Kennedy come on the scene as a television politician in the 1950s, but his dad had been a Hollywood producer back in the 1920s. So the Kennedys were brilliant at public imagery, particularly in the visual medium. Yeah, and it counts in the end. Okay. For Bloomberg Television and Radio, it's been a real delight to have Barbara Perry. She's University of Virginia professor and director of presidential studies with us. And Professor, sometime you and I have to sit down and tell Justice Powell stories, because I've got a lot of them. He was a wonderful man, I'll oh, tell you. Oh, please. I yeah. would love it. Yeah, it's my favorite thing. But not tonight. Okay. Jeannie Zaino and Rick Davis will That's be staying. Nice. Yeah. Well, let's do that. Okay. Jeannie Zaino and Rick Davis are staying with us. I'm going to get some thoughts from them now as we're just five minutes or so away from this debate. So, Rick, what are you looking for? I think the really hardest thing tonight in the debate is de determining by Biden when to fact check and when not to fact check. He's under enormous pressure by members of his own party to keep Donald Trump honest. Uh, but that is going to be an overwhelming obstacle for him in, in order to push his message through. So I, I think that balance is going to be the hardest thing to, to watch tonight and to see how he does with it, because certainly that will be the armchair quarterbacking tomorrow as to whether he did a good enough job tonight. Yeah, for our t uh, radio audience, we're now seeing, first of all, the Trump family walk in, and we just saw Dr. Joe Biden walk in as well with a mask on, I will say. So, Jeannie, what are you looking for? You know, I think what I'm looking for most is can Joe Biden maintain his composure and his sense of humor? I think if he can do those two things, 
and he can make the case that Donald Trump has stumbled on this pandemic, he will have done himself a favor. And by the same token, for President Trump, I'm really looking to see, can he shake this race up? I mean, Rick was talking at the outset about these polls we're seeing out of Pennsylvania, for instance, and some of these battleground states, which have Joe Biden ahead still, some cases in double digits. So we've got about 30 plus days left. The president really has to shake up this race. He's got to speak to women. He's got to speak to seniors. And he's got to speak to the college educated. And also, I'm also looking, can he speak to Latinos? The, the campaign really believes he can. And so he may sprinkle some of that in tonight as well. Okay, again, for our radio audiences, we're watching Chris Wallace, the moderator. He's addressing the crowd there. Uh, as I said, about 100 people are there, socially distanced with space between the chairs, giving instructions as he typically does, saying, please, let's not have applause, let's not have any outbursts, things like that. We'll bring you this debate as soon as it starts, but he's not seated yet. So, so Rick, from your point of view, you said there's a real problem with the fact-checking. At the same time, Joe Biden just can't let a lot of falsehoods go by, can he? Well... We know Chris Wallace, the moderator, has already said that he is not going to play fact checker. And we know social media is going to be just alive and burning through this debate with fact checking and commentary. So there's 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 that aspect of it that he can rely on. But he has got to be able to have moments in this debate where he pushes back, where he says that's just not true. And they're going to have to be as symbolic as they are factual. And so I think that's a really difficult process for him. And, and secondarily, I think He's got to be the adult in the room. Part of his campaign message is in the drama. Let's get on with governing. And I think that's got to show up tonight as part of that, that mood and that, that messaging. So, Jeannie, as we're watching this now on television, radio, I'll describe it to you. I wonder if the debate has already started because the Trump family is sitting down there in front with no masks on. Dr. Joe Biden and the, the Biden side all has masks on. I wonder if we've already got the debate going about COVID-19 right now. We do. I absolutely agree. I was thinking the same thing. It's a striking contrast as you compare the two families. And I'm wondering again if we see the two candidates come out, Joe Biden making a statement with a mask and the president making a statement without one. We don't know yet. But I do think that it is Joe Biden who wants to talk about COVID and the pandemic and the issue of health care and the president who should focus more directly on the economy. And Chris Wallace now is moving toward his chair to be seated. We'll bring you that as soon as he begins the debate. Rick, we heard earlier from Kevin Cirilli that actually President Trump might want to feature his response to COVID-19, not try to hide it. Can he feature that and make a win out of it? Well, he has his own set of facts, and we've heard it over and over. And he's going to say what a great job the country has done in combating it. We're number one in all these various categories. And that is where some of the fact-checking may come in, uh, because I don't think the Biden team wants Donald Trump to set the tone on COVID. Yeah, I want to clarify something. Just, just What just happened was the first lady, Melania Trump, walked in. She does have a mask on. The, the Trump children do not, but she does. So I want to make that clear. At least Melania is making a statement there, Jeannie. Yeah, absolutely. We should say I believe the Trump children had the masks on when they were walking in, but took them off when they sat, if I saw that correctly. And, you know, I, and I would just say on this fact-checking issue, I am probably one of the very few who think that Joe Biden should not get roped into fact-checking too much. He should stick to what he has to do, which is focus like a laser beam on the pandemic. His empathy for the victims that the president hasn't expressed as much, over 200,000 dead. So I think that's what I would like to see. Yeah, Rick, I think you said something similar to that, that he can't get drawn into that. Uh, how difficult is it when you have somebody of the power, the powerful personality of President Trump for 90 minutes, really saying a lot of things, gesticulating things like that, to just stick to the knitting, as it were. David, you hit it. This is the biggest challenge Joe Biden's going to have. He's so deferential. He's so empathetic. He's so nice guy that, that, that this is the classic David and Goliath on this stage tonight. And we're going to see how David is able to move around uh, in, a, in a way behind a podium to avoid the insults and the, the overtures of, of Donald Trump. Trump will try to engage him directly, and all the advisors to Biden have told him the same thing. Stay out of that clutch. Stay on the ropes. Don't get locked into him. And it, this will be the battle of the century, I think, tonight. It's the battle of the century, Jeannie, but how much will be fought after the, the, the debate's over? To pick up on what Rick asked earlier, uh, Professor Perry, a lot of it's going to be social media afterwards. Absolutely. And I would... 
just watch it, you have one view. If you listen to the commentary, pay attention to social media, you can have a very different view. So we know that's the case, and I wonder how that's complicated by what Kevin said earlier, the fact there's not a traditional spin room because of the pandemic, but you've got reporters and other people outside. So I think we're going to see a lot more use of social media, and that's going to, I think, make a difference this time around. And Rico, you're just seconds away now from the two candidates going on the stage, I believe. How much pressure is this putting on social media, on Twitter and Facebook and things like that, to try to police what's being said? Well, I think the policing of it is going to be virtually uh, impossible when you talk about fact-checking. Uh, and so uh, you'll go to the reliable sources to, to see that information, but there'll be all kinds of disinformation out there. I would say the number one trend uh, question on Google right now is on unemployment. And so you know people are already starting to look at issues related to this debate. Yeah, maybe Disney announcing today that they're laying off 28,000 people, Jeannie, might have uh, provoked some interest. On, on yeah, Twitter. absolutely. Okay, we're going to go now to the debate. And Chris Wallace from Fox News, who is the moderator, who will be charged with actually enforcing the rules that both campaigns have agreed to. They always agree in advance to a lot of detailed rules. The question is, can they be enforced, particularly with a president who is very outgoing, I think it's fair to say. And now we are turning to Chris Wallace of Fox News in Cleveland. Good evening. From the health education campus of Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Clinic. I'm Chris Wallace of Fox News, and I welcome you to the first of the 2020 presidential debates between President Donald J. Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden. This debate is sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates. The commission has designed the format, six roughly 15-minute segments, with two-minute answers from each candidate to the first question, then open discussion for the rest of each segment. Both campaigns have agreed to these rules. For the record, I decided the topics and the questions in each topic. I can assure you, none of the questions has been shared with the commission or the two candidates. This debate is being conducted under health and safety protocols designed by the Cleveland Clinic, which is serving as the health security advisor to the commission for all four debates. As a precaution, both campaigns have agreed the candidates will not shake hands at the beginning of tonight's debate. The audience here in the hall has promised to remain silent. No cheers, no boos or other interruptions. So we, and more importantly, you, can focus on what the candidates have to say. No noise except right now, as we welcome the Republican nominee, President Trump, and the Democratic nominee, Vice President Biden. Gentlemen, a lot of people have been waiting for this night, so let's get going. Our first subject is the Supreme Court. President Trump, you nominated Amy Coney Barrett over the weekend to succeed the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the court. You say the Constitution is clear about your obligation and the Senate's to consider a nominee to the court. Vice President Biden, you say that this is an effort by the President and Republicans to jam through an appointment and what you call an abuse of power. My first question to both of you tonight, why are you right in the argument you make and your opponent wrong? And where do you think a Justice Barrett would take the court? President Trump, in this first segment, you go first, two minutes. Thank you very much, Chris. I will tell you very simply, we won the election. Elections have consequences. We have the Senate, we have the White House, and we have a phenomenal nominee, respected by all, top, top academic, uh, good in every way, good in every way. In fact, uh, some of her biggest endorsers are very liberal people from Notre Dame and other places. So I think she's going to be fantastic. We have plenty of time. Uh, even if we did it after the election itself. I have a lot of time after the election, as you know. So I think that uh, she will be outstanding. She's going to be uh, as good as anybody that has served on that court. We really feel that. Uh, we have a professor at Notre Dame, highly respected by all, said she's the single greatest student he's ever had. He's been a professor for a long time at a great school. 
and uh, we just uh, we won the election and therefore we have the right to choose her and very few people knowingly would say otherwise and by the way the democrats they wouldn't even think about not doing it if they had the only difference is to try and do it faster there's no way they would give it up they had merit garland but the problem is they didn't have the election so they were stopped and probably that would happen in reverse also definitely would happen in reverse so we won the election and we have the right to do it chris president trump thank you um same question to you vice president biden you have two minutes well first of all um thank you for doing this and looking thank forward you. to this mr president thank you, i uh the american people have a right to have a say who the supreme court nominee is and that say occurs when they vote for a United States senators and when they vote for the president of the United States. They're not going to get that chance now because we're in the middle of an election already. The election has already started. Tens of thousands of people have already voted. And so the thing that should happen is we should wait. We should wait and see what the outcome of this election is because that's the only way the American people get to express their view is by who they elect as president and who they elect as vice president. Now, What's at stake here is the president's made it clear he wants to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. He's been running on that, he ran on that, and he has been governing on that. He's in the Supreme Court right now trying to get rid of um, the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, which uh, will strip 20 million people from having insurance, health insurance now, if it, if, they, if it goes into court. And, and uh, the justice, and I have nothing, I'm not opposed to the justices, but she seems like a very fine person. What she's written before she went on the bench, which is her right, is she thinks that the Affordable Care Act is not constitutional. The other thing is on the court, and if, if, if it's struck down, what happens? Women's rights are fundamentally changed. Once again, a woman could be helped pay more money because she has a pre-existing condition of pregnancy. We're able to, they're able to charge a woman more for the same exact procedure a man did, gets. And that ended when we, in fact, passed the Affordable Care Act. And there's 100 million people who have pre-existing conditions, and they'll be taken away as well. Those pre-existing conditions, the insurance companies are going to love this. And so it's just not appropriate to do this before this election. If he wins the election and the Senate is Democrat or Republican, then it, he goes forward. If not, we should wait until February. Right. There aren't 100 million people with pre-existing conditions. As far as the say is concerned, the people already had their say. They, okay, Justice Ginsburg said very powerfully, very strongly, at some point, 10 years ago or so, she said a president in the Senate is elected for a period of time, but a president's elected for four years. We're not elected for three years. I'm not elected for three years. So we have the Senate, we have a president. He's elected to the next During election. that period of time, during that period of time, we have an opening. I'm not elected for three years, I'm elected for four years. The and the 100 million started. people, Joe, the 100 million people is totally wrong. I don't know where you got that number. The bigger problem that you have is that you're going to extinguish 180 million people with their private health care, that they're very That's happy simply with. not true. Well, you're certainly no, going, going to socialist. You're going to socialist. We're now into, gentlemen, we're now into open discussion. Open discussion. Open discussion. Yes, I agree. That had vice president. Number Biden. one, uh, he, he knows that uh, what I proposed. What I proposed is that uh, we expand Obamacare and we increase it. We do not wipe any. And one of the big debates we had with 23 of my colleagues trying to win the nomination that I won we're saying that Biden wanted to allow people to have private insurance still. They can. They do. They will under my proposal. It's not what you said, but and it's not what your is, party has said. That is simply your party wrong. doesn't say it. Your party wants simple. to go socialist medicine. My party is and me. socialist right healthcare. now, I am and the they're Democratic gonna dominate party. you, Joe. You know that. I am the Democratic Party right now. The platform of the not Democratic Party Harris. is what I, in fact, approved of. What I approved of. Now, here's the deal. The deal is that... It's going to wipe out pre-existing conditions. And by the way, the 20, the 200 million, the 200,000 people that have died on his watch, how many of those have survived? Well, there's 7 million people that contracted COVID. What does it mean for them going forward if you strike down 
the Affordable Care Act. And Joe, you've had 308,000 military people dying because you couldn't provide them proper health care in the military. So don't tell me I'm about this. I'm happy to talk about this. And if you were here, you, it wouldn't be 200. It would be 2 million people because you were very late on the draw. You late didn't want me draw. to ban China, which was heavily infected. You didn't want me to ban... All right, we're, gentlemen, we're, we're, which no, was heavily Mr. President, Mr. President, you would have been President, much later, Joe. Mr. President, much later. Mr. President, you're talking about two million people. Mr. President, as a moderator, <laughs> we are going to talk about COVID in the next segment, but go well, ahead. Let me finish. The point is that the president also is opposed to Roe v. Wade. That's on the ballot as well in the court, in the court. And so that's also at stake right now. And so the election is all You don't know it's on the ballot. I, why is it in the ballot? Because, because why is it on the ballot? It's not on the ballot. It's on the ballot in the court. I don't think so. In the court. Well, there's nothing happening there. Donald, would you, you just don't know from her me? view on Roe v. Wade. You I don't, don't know her view. Well, all right. Let's, all right. Let's talk. I would, we got a lot to unpack here, gentlemen. We got a lot of time. So, <laughs> uh, on health care. And then we'll come back to Roe v. Wade. All right. Mr. President, the Supreme Court will hear a case a week after the election in which the Trump administration, along with 18 state attorneys general, are seeking to overturn That's right. Obamacare, to end Obamacare. You have spent the last... Because they want to give good health care. If I may ask right. my question, sir. Good health care. Over uh, the last four years, you have promised to repeal and replace Obamacare, but you have never in these four years come up with a plan, a comprehensive plan yes, to I replace have. Obamacare. Of course I have. Well, I'll I got rid of the individual mandate. Excuse me. I got rid of the individual mandate, which was a big chunk a of Obamacare. That is That is absolutely a big thing. That was the worst I, I part of ask, Obamacare. Sir, Chris, that was the worst part of Obamacare. Let me ask my question. Well, I'll, I'll ask Joe. I, 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 the individual I, mandate was the most unpopular Mr. aspect Mr. of Obamacare. President, I got rid of it. I'd like and we will protect people. Mr. President, I'm the moderator of this debate, and I would like you to let me ask my question, and then you can answer your question. You, in the course of these four years, have never come up with a comprehensive plan to replace Obamacare. And just this last Thursday, you signed a largely symbolic executive order to protect people with pre-existing conditions five days before this debate. So my question, sir, is what is the Trump health care plan? Right. Well, first of all, I guess I'm debating you, not him, but that's okay. I'm not surprised. Let me just tell you something. That <laughs> there's nothing symbolic. I'm cutting drug prices. I'm going with favored nations, which no president has the courage to do because you're going against big pharma. Drug prices will be coming down 80 or 90 percent. You could have done it during your 47 year period in government, but you didn't do it. <laughs> Nobody's done it. So we're cutting health care. All real? of the things that we've done, yes, insulin. I give you an example insulin. It's going to, it was destroying families, destroying people because I'm getting it for so cheap. It's like water, you want to know the truth. So cheap. Take a look at all of the drugs that what we're doing, prescription drug prices. We're going to allow our governors now to go to other countries to buy drugs okay. because when it's they right. pay just a I, tiny fraction. I say, this is open discussion. No, let me ask you about, let me, let me, this is happy, big stuff. Sir, you'll be happy. I'm about to pick up on one of your points to ask the vice president, which is he points out that you would like to add a public option to Obamacare, and yes. the argument that he makes, and other Republicans make, is that that is going to end private insurance. It is and not. Well, I'm sorry, ask you the question. It will not end. What your party says, by the way. It will end private insurance and create a government takeover of health care. It does it not. It's only for those people who are so poor they qualify for Medicaid. They can get that free in most states, except governors who want to deny people who are poor Medicaid. Anyone who qualifies for Medicare would, excuse me, Medicaid would automatically be enrolled in the public option. The vast majority of the American people would still not be in that option. Number one. So you agree two, with Bernie number, Sanders, I, I, far I, I, left, on the manifesto we, we call it? With manifesto. That gives you socialized medicine. Look, hey, are I'm, you I'm saying not you didn't agree? To him. The fact of the matter is, I beat Bernie Sanders. Not by I'm, much. I, I beat him a whole hell of a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm here standing much. facing Pocahontas you. Pocahontas would have left well, two days early. You would have lost every primary. All he knows how to do is Tuesday. You got Look, very lucky. Here's the deal. I got very lucky. I'm get very lucky tonight as well. And tonight I'm going to make what? sure because here's the deal. Here's the deal. 
The fact is that everything he's saying so far is simply a lie. I'm not here to call out his lies. Everybody knows he's a liar. But you I just agree. want to make I sure. Tell you the I, 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 I want to make sure. I did last thing you last night, first thing you <laughs> I want to make Mr. sure. President, can you let him finish, sir? No, he doesn't know how to do that. He has. You'd be you know, surprised. He, he, you pick it, be surprised. The Go wrong ahead, guy, the wrong night know. at the wrong time. Listen, you agreed with Here's Bernie Sanders to the manifesto. The whole idea. Let, let, let him survive. There Go. is no manifesto, number Please one. Please let him speak, Mr. President. Number two. You just lost the left. Number two. I, I, you just lost the left. You agreed with Bernie Sanders on a plan. Uh, folks, absolutely folks, agreed do you have any idea, idea what, what this is socialized, doing? Call it Mr. Mr. You have they do socialized medicine. Mr. President. I'll tell you what. He is not for any help for people needing health care. Because, because he, in fact, already has cost 10 million people their health care that they had from their employers because of his recession. Number one. Number oh, two, oh, yeah, yeah. there are 20 million people getting health care through Obamacare now that he wants to take it away. He won't ever look you in the eye and say that's what he wants to do. Take it away. No, I want to give number better health care at a much lower price but, because by Obamacare the way, he doesn't is know no how. Good. He doesn't know how I've to do that. I've already fixed it. He has never I've offered a plan. fixed it to an extent. He has Obamacare, never done a single thing. As you might thing. know, but probably doesn't. Obamacare you realize if you're both good, speaking at the same time. Good. And it's still expensive. Let, let, let the president's go ahead, sir. Obamacare is no good. We made it better. And I had a choice to make very early on. We took away the individual mandate. We guaranteed pre-existing conditions, but took away the individual mandate. Listen, this is the way it is. And that destroyed, that, they shouldn't even call it Obamacare. Then I had a choice to make. Do I let my people run it really well or badly? If I run it badly, they'll probably blame him, but they'll blame me. But more importantly, I want to help people, okay? I said, you've got to run it so well. That's and I just had a meeting with them. They said, the problem is no matter how well you run Obamacare, it's a disaster. It's too expensive. Right. Premiums are too it. high. And That's it doesn't work. That's so we, we, we do no, want to no, get no. rid of it. I, we, well, Chris, we want to get rid of it. I understand it, sir, but I have, to, I have to give better. you roughly Good. equal time. Good. Please let the vice president talk. Good. He has no plan for health care. He please. He sends out wishful thinking. He has executive orders that have no power. He hasn't lowered drug costs for anybody. He's been promising a health care plan since he got elected. He has none, like almost everything else he talks about. He does not have a plan. He doesn't have a plan. And the fact is, this man doesn't know what he's talking about. All right. I, have one, I have one final question for you, sure. uh, Mr. Vice President. If Senate Republicans, <laughs> we were talking originally about the Supreme Court here, if Senate Republicans go ahead and confirm Justice Barrett, uh, there has been talk about ending the filibuster or even packing the court, adding to the nine justices there. You call this a distraction by the president, but in fact, it wasn't brought up by the president. It was brought up by some of your Democratic colleagues in, well, the, saying, in the Congress. So my question to you is, you have refused in the past to talk about it. Are you willing to tell the American people tonight whether or not you will support either ending the filibuster or packing the court? Whatever position I take in that, that will become the issue. The issue is the American people should speak. You should go out and vote. You're in voting now. Vote and let your senators know how you strong you, you feel. Let vote now. You're going to pack the Make court? sure you, in fact, let people know he is your senators. I'm not going to answer the question. Why would you answer that because question? Because the question is, is the New question Supreme is, just is the radical question. left. Will you who shut is up, your, man. Listen, who is on your list, Joe? This Who's is on so your list? Right. Gentlemen, is, I think this is so this unprecedented. We have ended this segment. We're going to move on to the second segment. That was really a productive segment, wasn't it? Keep yapping, man. The people understand you. <laughs> they 47 do. years, you've done nothing. They understand. Oh. All right. The second subject <laughs> is COVID-19, which is an awfully serious subject. So let's try to be serious about it. We have had more than 7 million cases of coronavirus in the United States, and more than 200,000 people have died. Even after we produce a vaccine, experts say that it could be months or even years before we come back to anything approaching normal. My question for both of you is, based on what you have said and done so far and what you have said you would do starting in 2021, why should the American people trust you more than your opponent to deal with this public health crisis going forward? 
in this case, the question goes to you first, sir. Two minutes uninterrupted. Good luck. 200,000 dead. As you said, over 7 million infected in the United States. We, in fact, have 5%, well, 4% of the world's population, 20% of the deaths. 40,000 people a day are contracting COVID. In addition to that, about between 750 and 1,000 people a day are dying. When he was presented with that number, he said, it is what it is. Well, it is what it is because you are who you are. That's why it is. The president has no plan. He hasn't laid out anything. He knew all the way back in February how serious this crisis was. He knew it was a deadly disease. What did he do? He's on tape as acknowledging he knew it. He said he didn't tell us or give people a warning of it because he didn't want to panic the American people. You don't panic. He panicked. In addition to that, what did he do? He went in and he, we were insisting that the Chinese, the, the people we had on the ground in China should be able to go to Wuhan and determine for themselves how dangerous this was. He did not even ask Xi to do that. He told us what a great job she was doing. He said, we owe him a debt of gratitude for being so transparent with us. And what did he do then? He then did nothing. He, he waited and waited and waited. He still doesn't have a plan. I laid out Sir, back in March minute. exactly so, what so. we should be doing. And I laid out again in July what we should be doing. We should be providing all the protective gear pass. We should be providing the money the House has passed in order to be able to go out and get people the help they need to keep their businesses open, open schools that cost a lot of money. You should get out of your bunker and get out of the sand trap and get in, in your golf course and go in the Oval Office and bring together the Democrats and Republicans and fund what needs to be done now to save lives. So if wait, we wait, would have listened wait, to wait, you. you have two minutes, sir. If we would have listened to you, the country would have been left wide open. Millions of people would have died, not 200,000. And one person is too much. It's China's fault. It should have never happened. They stopped it from going in, but it was China's fault. And by the way, when you talk about numbers, you don't know how many people died in China. You don't know how many people died in Russia. You don't know how many people died in India. They don't exactly give you a straight count, just so you understand. But if you look at what we've done, I closed it and you said he's xenophobic. He's a racist and he's xenophobic. Because you didn't think we should have closed our country. Wait a minute. It's two minutes. You didn't think we should have closed our country because you thought it was too, it was terrible. You wouldn't have closed it for another two months. By my doing it early, in fact, Dr. Fauci said, President Trump saved thousands of lives. Many of your Democrat governors said, President Trump did a phenomenal job. We worked with the governor. Oh, really? Go take a look. <laughs> the governor said I did a phenomenal job. Most of them said that. In fact, <laughs> People that would not be necessarily on my side said that. President Trump did a phenomenal job. We did. We got the gowns. We got the masks. We made the ventilators. You wouldn't have made ventilators. And now we're weeks away from a vaccine. We're doing therapeutics already. Fewer people are dying when they get sick. Far fewer people are dying. We've done a great job. The only thing I haven't done a good job, and that's because of the fake news. No matter what you say to them, they give you bad press on it. It's just fake news. They give you good press. They give me bad press because that's the way it is, unfortunately. But let me just tell you something. I don't care. I've gotten used to it. But I'll tell you, Joe, you could never have done the job that we did. You don't have it in your blood. You could have never done that job. I know how to do the job. I know how to get the job done. Well, you done. didn't do very well in swine flu. Mm -hmm. H1N1, you were a disaster. Your own chief 14, of staff said you were a disaster. 14,000 people died, not 200,000. There was no very economic recession. Sir, you made a, there you made a point. Let him answer. And there was no one, there was no, we didn't shut down the economy. This is his economy that's being, he shut down. The reason it's shut down is because, look, you folks at home, how many of you got up this morning and had an empty chair at the kitchen table because someone died of COVID? How many of you are in a situation where you lost your mom or dad and you couldn't even speak to them? You had a nurse holding the phone up so you could, in fact, say goodbye. You would have lost far How more many people. people. Far that more is, people. And you would have been. And by the way, late. Your own, his, 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 own, his own CDC director says we could lose as many as another 200,000 people between now and the end of the year. And he held up. He said, if we just wear a mask, we can save half those numbers. Just just a mask. And by the way, in terms of the, the whole notion of a vaccine, 
prefer a vaccine, but we, I don't trust him at all, nor do you. I know you don't. What we trust is a scientist. You know, we trust, trust Dr. Johnson, Fauci. Johnson, 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 Johnson. We, 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 and, okay, by know, the way, gentlemen, and gentlemen then, let, me, let me move on to questions about the future, because you both have touched on one of the, two of the questions I'm going to ask. Uh, to, focusing on the future first, President Trump, you have repeatedly either contradicted or been at odds with some of your government's own top scientists. The week before last, the head of the Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Redfield, said it would be summer before the vaccine would become generally available to the public. You said that he was confused and mistaken. Those were your two words. Yeah. But Dr. Slowey, the head of your Operation Warp Speed, has said exactly the same thing. Are they both wrong? Well, I've spoken to the companies and we can have it a lot sooner. It's a very political thing because people like this would rather make it political than save lives. Right. It is a very political thing. I've spoken to Pfizer. I've spoken to all of the people that you have to speak to. We have great Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, and others. They can go faster than that by a lot. Become very political because the left, or I don't know if so, I call so you're left, I don't know what that I call the head of your operation, Warp Speed, Dr. Smiley. I disagree with him. Yeah. No, I disagree with both of them. And he didn't say that. He said it could be there, but it could also be much sooner. I, I had him in my office two he days talked, ago. He talked about the summer, sir, before it's generally available. Just like he Dr. said Dr. it's a possibility that we'll have the answer before November 1st. It could I'm, also I'm be after that. It's generally available. It, well, we're going to deliver it right away. We have the military all set up logistically, they're all set up. We have our military that delivers soldiers, and they can do 200,000 a day. They're going to be this is the them. same man. It's who all set up. By Easter, this would be gone away. By the warm weather, it'd be gone. Miraculous, like a miracle. And by the way, maybe you could inject some bleach in your arm, and that would take care of it. This is the that same man. That was said sarcastic. That was you know that. I, I, I was said sarcastic. And so here's the deal: this man is talking about a vaccine. Every serious. Every serious company is talking about maybe having a vaccine done by the end of the year. But the distribution of that vaccine will not occur until sometime beginning or the middle of next year to get it out if we get the vaccine. And pray God we will. Pray God we Mr. will. Mr. Vice President, I want to pick up, though, on, the I, I, I want to pick up on this question, though. You say the public can trust the scientists, but they can't trust President Trump. In fact, you said that again tonight. Your running mate, Senator Harris, goes further, saying the public health experts, quote, will be muzzled, will be suppressed. Given the fact that polls already show that people are concerned about the vaccine and are reluctant to take it, are you and your running mate, Senator Harris, contributing to that fear? No more than the question you just asked him. You pointed out, he puts pressure and disagrees with his own scientist. But you're saying Everybody you can't, or, knows, or Senator Harris is saying no, you can't trust the scientists. No, well, no, no, you can't trust the scientists. She didn't, she didn't say that. You can't she, trust She the, said the public health experts, quote, will be muzzled, will yes. be suppressed. Well, yeah, that's what he's going to try to do. But there's millions of scientists, there's thousands of scientists out there, like here at this great hospital, that don't work for him. Their job doesn't depend on him. That's not, they're the people, they're, and by the way, to the scientists fact, that are in charge, by the way, they will have the vaccine very soon. Do you believe for a moment what he's telling you in light of all the lies he's told you about the whole issue relating to COVID? He still hasn't even acknowledged that he knew this was happening, knew how dangerous it was going to be back in February, and he didn't even tell you. He's on record as saying it. He panicked or he just looked at the stock market. One of the two, because guess what? A lot of people die and a lot more are going to die unless he gets a lot smarter, a lot quicker so, than Mr. President. Did you use the word smart? Uh, so you said you went to Delaware State, but you forgot the name of your college. You didn't <laughs> go to Delaware State. You graduated either the lowest or almost the lowest in your class. Don't ever use the word smart with me. Don't ever use that word. Oh, give me a break. Because you know what? There's nothing smart about you, Joe. 47 years, you've done nothing. Let's have this debate. And if you would have had, let me just tell you something, Joe. No, if you would have had the charge of what I was put through, I had to close the greatest economy in the history of our country. And by the way, now it's being built again. See, he's going, going up to the economy in the next segment, sir. Okay. It's going up fast. Okay. So to I, when it comes to how the virus has been handled so far, the two of you have taken very different approaches, and this is going to affect how the virus is handled going forward by whichever of you ends up becoming the next president. I want to quickly go through several of those. Reopenings. 
Vice President Biden, you have been much more reluctant than President Trump about reopening the economy and schools. Why, sir? Because he doesn't have a plan. If I were running, I'd know how, what the plan is. You've got to provide these businesses the ability to have the money to be able to reopen with the PPE as well as with the sanitation they need. You have to provide Tell them Nancy to, Pelosi. To, well, he's just shush for a minute. Tell it to Nancy, Nancy no, Pelosi. And and Schumer, by the way, yeah. Nancy Pelosi and Schumer, they have a plan. He yeah. won't even meet with them. The Republicans won't meet with okay. the Senate. Okay. And, he, and he sits he sits on his golf course. And, well, I mean, uh, literally, okay. think about it. You probably uh, play more than it. I do, Jim. Uh, what about this question <laughs> of reopening and the fact? Well, he wants to shut down this country. Oh, and okay. I want to keep it open. And we you did a great thing by shutting it, it down. Shut it down. Wait a minute, Jim. Let, let me shut you down for a second, Jim, just for one second. We want to... He wants to shut down the country. We just went through it. We had to because we didn't know anything about the disease. Now we found that elderly people with heart problems and uh, diabetes and different problems are very, very vulnerable. We learned a lot. Young children aren't. Uh, even younger people aren't. We've learned a lot. But he wants to shut it down. Uh, more people will be hurt. By continuing, if you look at Pennsylvania, if you look at certain states that have been shut down, they have Democrat governors all. One of the reasons they're shut down is because they want to keep it shut down until after the election. Mm -hmm. I, want, I want to move on to another subject. I want to move on to another subject. Those, I, I, but I those states, those states are not subject. doing well that are shut down. Right. Right. Now, respond uh, to President Trump, shut down you have country. begun to increasingly question the effectiveness of masks as a disease preventer. And in fact, recently you have cited the, the issue of, of waiters touching their masks and touching plates. Are you questioning no, the, I think the, the masks efficacy are okay. of, of You have masks? to understand, if you look, I mean, I have a mask right here. I put a mask on it, you know, when I think I need it. Tonight, as an example, everybody's had a test and you've had social distancing and all of the things that you have to, but I Just wear masks around. when needed. When needed, I wear a mask. Okay, let me ask. I don't, have, I don't wear a mask like him. Every time you see him, he's got a mask. He could be speaking... 200 feet away from it, he shows up with the biggest mask I've ever seen. I will <laughs> say, Vice, I will President, say this. Vice President Biden, go ahead, sir. Look, the way to open businesses is give them the wherewithal to be able to open. We provided money. The but I was asking you, sir, about masks. Well, masks, masks make a big difference. His own head of the CDC said if we just wore masks between now, if there, everybody wore masks in social distance between now and January, we'd probably save up to 100,000 lives. It matters. And they've also it said matters. the opposite. They've and also said no, no serious person said the opposite. The no so we'll serious right, person. Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci said the opposite. He did not I, I say the opposite. He said very strongly, a left in this masks segment. are not good. Then he changed his mind. He said masks are good. I, I'm, I'm okay ask, with masks. I want to ask you both about one last subject because your different approaches has even affected the way that you have campaigned. Uh, President Trump, you're holding large rallies with crowds packed together, thousands of people. Outside. Outside, yes, sir. Agreed. Uh, Vice President Biden, you are holding much smaller uh, events with yes, nobody will show up. People with <laughs> What's true? With, nobody shows up to his okay. rallies. All right. In any case, why are you holding the big rallies? Why are you not? You go first, sir. Because people want to hear what I have to say. I mean, but you know, I'm doing a great job as a debate. president, and I'll have 25, 35,000 people show up at airports. We use airports. Are you not worried about the We have a lot of issues, people. Sir. Well, so far, we have had no problem whatsoever. It's outside. That's a big difference, according to the experts. And we do them outside. We have tremendous crowds, as you see. I mean, every and, and literally on 24 hours notice. And Joe does the circles and has three people someplace. Okay. Oh, by the way, did, that, you, did, that, did you see that, one of the last for big rallies he had? And a reporter came up to him to ask him a question. He said, no, no, no. Stand back. Put on your mask. Put on a mask. Have you been tested? I'm way, I'm way far away from those other people. So that's what he said. I can't. I, I'm going to be okay. He's not worried about you. He's not worried about the people out there breathing in one another. We've had no negative effect. No, no negative, negative effect. effect. We've no. had no negative effect. And we've well, had 35, 40,000 right. people in the Israelis. Just yes. quickly finish yeah. up because I want to move on to our next one. Yes, I would. He's been totally irresponsible the way in which he has handled the, the social distancing and people wearing masks, basically encouraged them not to. All right, Ben, he's a fool on this. If you could get the crowds, you would have done the same thing. But you can't. Nobody cares. Gentlemen, can we move on Nobody to the economy? Gentlemen, can we move on to the economy? Yes. The economy 
is, I think it's fair to say, recovering faster than expected from the shutdown Much this, in the second quarter. The unemployment rate fell to 8.4 percent last month. The Federal Reserve says the hit to, to growth, which is going to be there, is not going to be nearly as big as they had expected. President Trump, you say we are in a V-shaped recovery. Vice President Biden, you say it's more of a K-shape. What difference does that mean to the American people in terms of the economy? President Trump, in this segment, you go first. So we built the greatest economy in history. We closed it down because of the China plague. When the plague came in, we closed it down, which was very hard psychologically to do. He didn't think we should close it down, and he was wrong. And again, two million people would be dead now instead of still 204,000 people is too much. One person is too much. Should have never happened from China. But what happened is we closed it down and now we're reopening and we're doing record business. We had 10.4 million people in a four month period that we've put back into the workforce. That's a record the likes of which nobody's ever seen before. And he wants to close down the, he will shut it down again. He will destroy this country. You know, a lot of people between drugs and alcohol and depression, when you start shutting it down, you take a look at what's happening at some of your Democrat run states where they have these tough shutdowns. And I'm telling you, it's because they don't want to open it. One of them came out last week. You saw that. Oh, we're going to open up on November 9th. Why November 9th? Because it's after the election. They think they're hurting us by keeping them closed. They're hurting people. People know what to do. They can social distance. They can wash their hands. They can wear masks. They can do whatever they want. But they got to open these states up. When you look at North Carolina, when you look at these governors are under siege, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and a couple of others, you got to open these states up. It's not fair. You're talking about almost it's like being in prison. And you look at what's going on with divorce. Look at what's going on with alcoholism and drugs. It's a very, very sad thing. And he'll close down the whole country. This guy will close down the whole country and destroy our country. Our country is coming back incredibly well, setting records as it does it. We don't need somebody to come in and say, let's shut it down. All right. Your two minutes, sir. We're now moved to you. As I, as I said, posing the question, the president says it's a V-shaped recovery. You say it's a K-shaped recovery. What's the difference? The difference is millionaires and billionaires like him in the middle of the COVID crisis have done very well. Another billionaires have, really have made another $300 billion because of his profligate tax proposal and he only focused on the market. But you folks at home, you folks living in Scranton and Claymont and all the small towns and working class towns in America, how well are you doing? This guy paid well, a total of seven hundred and fifty dollars in taxes. Sir, and he sir, wait, wait, no, sir, it's just the wrong thing. Yeah, I understand. You've agreed to the two minutes, so please let him have it. Do I get my time back? The fact is that he has, in fact, worked on this in a way that he's going to be the first president of the United States to leave office, having fewer jobs in his administration than when he became president. Fewer jobs than when he became president. First one in American history. Secondly. The people who have lost their jobs are those people who have been on the front lines, those people who have been saving our lives, those people who have been out there dying, people who have been putting themselves in the way to make sure that we could all try to make it. And the idea that he is insisting that we go forward and open when you have almost half the states in America with a significant increase in COVID deaths and COVID cases in the United States of America. And he wants to open it up more. Why does he want to open it up? Why doesn't he take care of the American? You can't fix the economy until you fix the COVID crisis. And he has no intention of doing anything about making it better for you all at home in terms of your health and your safety. Schools, why are schools open? Because it costs a lot of money to open them safely. You know, they, they were going to give, his administration was going to give the teachers and school students masks. And then they decided, no, couldn't do that because it's not a national emergency not a national emergency. They've done nothing to help small businesses. Nothing. They're closing. One in six is now gone. He ought to get on the job and take care of the needs of the American people so we can open safely. All right. Your time is up, sir. Well, we are going to get to the... I have gonna, to respond to that. Well, you both had two minutes, sir. 
Excuse me, he made a statement. I, and so did you. People want their schools, no, people want their schools open. They don't want to be shut down. They don't want their state shut down. They want their restaurants. I look at New York, it's so sad what's happening in New York. It's almost like a ghost town. And I'm not sure it can ever recover what they've done in New York. People want their places open. They want to get back to their lives. People They'll be careful, be safe. but they want their schools open. Okay. I'm the one safe. that brought back football. By the way, I brought back Big Ten <laughs> football. It was me, and it, I'm very happy to do it. And <laughs> All right, people that's, of that's, Ohio are very proud of me. And you know we're how gonna I get back, when we're it's a gentlemen, We're going to get to your economic plans going forward in a moment. But first, Mr. President, as you well know, there's a new report that in 2016, the year you were elected president, and 2017, your first year as president, that you paid $750 a year in federal income tax each of those years. I know that you pay a lot of other taxes, but I'm asking you the specific question. Is it true that you paid $750 in federal income taxes each of those two years? I paid millions of dollars in taxes, millions of dollars of income tax. And let me just tell you, there was a story in one of the papers. That I, paid, your tax I paid $38 million one year. I paid $27 million Show us your tax one year. Returns. I went... Uh, you'll see it as soon as it's finished. You'll see it. You know, if you want to do, go to the Board of Elections. There's a 118-page or so report that says everything I have, every bank I have, I'm totally under leveraged because the assets are extremely good. And we have a very, we have a, we, I built a great I'm asking company. you a specific question, which but is. Let me tell you. I, I understand all of that. I, I understand all of that. But, but let me, a, I, no, Mr. President, I'm asking you a question. Will you tell us how much you paid in federal income taxes in 2016 and 2017? Millions of dollars. You paid millions of dollars? Millions of dollars. So yes. not seven hundred Millions of dollars. And you'll get to see it. I, I, and you'll get to when? see it. But let me so just tell you, Chris, let me just say something. that It was the tax laws. I don't want to pay tax. Before I came here, I was a private developer. I was a private business people. Like every other private person, unless they're stupid, they go through the laws and that's what it is he passed a tax bill that gave us all these privileges for depreciation and for uh, tax credits we built the building and we get tax credits like the hotel on pennsylvania avenue you get okay. a massive which by the way was given to me by the obama administration if you can believe that now the man got fired yeah, no, no, right no. after that happened but vice president a, biden you want to respond yeah i do want to respond look the tax code that made him put him in a position that he pays less tax than a school teacher make on the money a school teacher makes is because of him take he says he's smart because he can take advantage of the tax code and he does take advantage of the tax code that's why i'm going to eliminate the trump tax cuts and we're going to we're going to eliminate those tax okay. cuts and make sure that we invest in the people who in fact need the help People out there need help. But why do you need to do it over 20, in the last 25 no, no, years? No, because you are why president. Why did you do it over Because you are president screwing no, 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 no. things up. You were a senator. You're and the worst the president voice. America has ever had. Hey, hey, Come Joe, on. Let, me, let me just say, Joe, I've done more in, in 47 months. I've done more than you've done in 47 years, Joe. We've done things that you never even thought of doing, okay. including Gentlemen. fixing the broken military that you gave me, let's, including let's, taking care we're of your talking, Mr. President, we're talking about the economy. I'd like to ask you about your plans going forward because, uh, Mr. Vice President, your economic plan, if you were to be yes, elected sir. president, uh, focuses a lot on big government, big taxes, big spending. I want to focus first on the taxes. You propose more than $4 trillion over a decade in new taxes, on individuals making more than $400,000 a year and on corporations. President Trump says that that kind of an increase in taxes is going to hurt the economy as it's just coming out of a recession. Well, just take a look at what is the, the analysis done by Wall Street firms. Points out that my, my economic plan would create 7 million more jobs than his in four years, number one. And number two, it would create an additional $1 trillion in economic growth because it would be about buying American. That we have to, we're going to make this federal government spend $600 billion a year on everything from ships to steel to buildings and the like. 
And under my proposal, we're going to make sure that every penny of that has to be made by a company. But, but respectfully, sir, so I'm talking about taxes, not spending. Oh, well, uh, by the way, I'm going to eliminate a significant number of the tax. I'm going to make the, the, the corporate tax 28%. It shouldn't be 21%. You have 19 company, 91 companies, federal, I mean, in the Fortune 500, who don't pay a single penny in tax, making billions of dollars. Why didn't you do it? Billions of dollars. You were vice because, president Obama. Because you, in fact, passed that. That was right. your I tax proposal. I got it done. And you know what happened? You got it done. Our economy boomed. And like it's never boomed. The economy well, let, Mr. Mr. President, let me let me, let me, Mr. President, let me pick up on that. You would continue your free market approach, lower taxes, more deregulation, correct? Not lower taxes for American people. But, but, let me, Excuse me. But, in, but in Obama's, you talk about the economy booming. It turns out that in Obama's final three years as president, more jobs were created, a million and a half more jobs than in the first three years of your presidency. They had the slowest recovery since 19, economic recovery since 1929. It was the slowest recovery. Also, they took over something that was down here. All you had to do is turn on the lights and you pick up a lot. But they had the well, slowest wait. economic recovery since 1929. Let me tell you about the stock market. When the stock market goes up, that means jobs. It also means 401ks. If you got in, if you ever became president with your ideas, you want to terminate my tax, my taxes, I, I'll tell you what, you'll lose half of the companies that have poured in here will leave, and plenty half of companies, companies that are already here, they'll leave from other places. Have they will leave, leave, and you will have a depression, the likes of which you've never seen. Look, Mr. we inherited the worst recession short of a depression in American history. I was asked to bring it back. We were able to have an economic recovery that created the jobs you're talking about. We handed him a booming economy. He blew it. It wasn't he blew booming. It. He blew it. Blew it wasn't booming. It, it, was, was, a, it was the weakest the, recovery well, sir, is since it to, Wait, wait. Is it, fair to, is it fair to say he blew it when, in when fact, COVID there was, when there was record un, low unemployment yeah. before COVID? Yeah, but, but because what he did, even before COVID, manufacturing went in the hole. Manufacturing went in the hole. Excuse number me, one. Chris. Wait. Number two. Chris. Number three. They said this it would take. Rejected. No, you're number two. No. Chris, Chris. They said it would this take guy. a miracle to bring back manufacturing. I brought back 700,000 jobs. They brought back nothing. They gave up on manufacturing. We did not. Standard guy. fare. I'm the guy that he brought totally back gave the up on manufacturing. We brought back, I was asked to bring back Chrysler and General Motors. We brought them back right here in the state of Ohio and Michigan. He blew it. They're gone. He blew it. And in fact, they're going. Ohio had the best year it's ever had last year. No. Michigan had the best year they've ever that had. Is not Many true. car companies no, came no. in from Germany, from no, Japan, no. went to Michigan, no. went to Ohio. They're not. And they Mr. didn't Vice, come in right here. Mr. Vice President, cut And so you take a look at what he's actually done. He's done very little. His trade deals are the same way. He talks about these great trade deals. You know, he talks about the art of the deal. China's made perfected the art of the steel. We have a higher deficit with China now than we did before. We have the highest defi trade deficit China with ate Mexico. Your lunch. That right, ate 10%. In, in, in in China China ate your lunch, lunch Joe. And no wonder your son goes in and he takes out he takes out no. billions of dollars, takes out billions of dollars to manage. He makes millions of dollars. And also, Simply while we're at true. it, why is yeah. it, just out of curiosity, the mayor of Moscow's wife gave your son three and a half million dollars. What did he true. do to deserve it? That what did he do with Barista to deserve $183,000? None of that is true. Not an answer. Not, none of that is true. Oh, really? He totally didn't give three and a half Mr. President, Mr. Mr. President, totally, President, please. Totally discredited. Totally discredited. And by the way. Well, wait, he didn't get three and a half million dollars, Joe? Mr. Vice he got three Mr. And President, dollars. That is not true. Oh, really, Mr. No. President? But, Mr. You, it's an it's an open discussion. Please, no, you, you, it's a fact. Well, there's, there's you have not raised an fact. issue. Let the Vice totally President answer. Discredited. Did Bruce was pay him 183,000 a month when, when, with when, no when, experience when, in energy? Ne Mr. Well, President, no my son did nothing wrong at Barista. I think he did, Mr. President. The only guy that let him answer. Him. He didn't want to let me answer because he knows I have the truth. His position has been totally, thoroughly discredited. By who? And the media. By everybody. Well, by the, by media, the media, by our because allies, by the about, World Bank, the by, er by everyone has discredited. Matter of fact, matter of fact, Mr. even President, the people who testified under oath.
So let me ask you this. Senator, no, 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 go ahead. Mr. Let I'm me, listening to you. People under, you get three and a half million dollars from Moscow. Te he testified under oath in his administration, said, I did my job and I did it very well. well I really, did it I honorably. Know who they are. Every, well, I'll give you the list I'll of the people them. who tested. No, no, go ahead, sir. Sure, you, you've already fired most of them because they did some a good job. Some people don't. Well, do here's it. With you, yeah, you get the, wait a minute. You get the final word. Mr. Well, it's hard to get any word in with this clown. Excuse me. This. Hey, hey this let me person. just say to you. No, no, no. Uh, Mr. President. Three and a half Mr. million, Joe. That is simply Why did he deserve three and a half million from it, Moscow? Look, here's the deal. We want to talk about families and ethics. I don't want to do that. I mean, his family, we could talk about all night. His family's my already... Family, no, 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 my I, family already lost a fortune by coming down and helping us with government. And that's such a... Mr. President, every single one of them lost a fortune. This is not about my family or his family. family. It's government. about your family. They the American people, have he doesn't... Dollars. That's not true. It doesn't want to talk about what you need. You... The American people. It's about you. That's what we're talking about. Yeah. All right. That's the, end of the, that's the end of the segment. We're, mo we're moving on. It didn't take them. Well, Vice President, it's, 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 no. Can it's, I be honest? It's a very important question. Try to be honest. No, I, he stood it. up. No, he stood I, up. I, the answer to the question is no. Ukraine. It's, no, I, sir. With a billion sir, dollars, if you that is if you're, you know what you're really not stop. true. You're, you're doing it. You're going to have a true. Gentlemen. I hate to raise my voice, but it seems to me, why shouldn't I be different than the two of you? So here's the deal. We have five, six segments. We have ended that segment. We're going to go to the next segment. In that segment, you each are going to have two uninterrupted moments. In those two interrupted minutes, Mr. President, you can say anything you want. I'm going to ask a question about race, but if you want to answer about something else, go ahead. But we, we, I think that the country would be better served if we allowed both people to speak with fewer interruptions. I, I'm appealing to you, sir, to do that. Well, and him too. Well, frankly, you've been doing more interrupting. Oh, that's all right, but he does plenty. Well, less than, <laughs> sir, less does than plenty. No, less than you have. Let's please continue on. The issue of race. Vice President Biden, you say that President Trump's response to the violence in Charlottesville three years ago, when he talked about very fine people on both sides, was what directly led you to launch this run for president. Oh, yes, sir. President Trump, you have often said that you believe you have done more for black Americans than any president, with the possible exception of Abraham Lincoln. My question for the two of you is why should voters trust you rather than your opponent to deal with the race issues facing this country over the next four years? Vice President Biden, you go first. It's about equity and equality. It's about decency. It's about the Constitution. And we have never walked away from trying to acquire, acquire equity for everyone, equality for the whole of America. But we've never accomplished it. But we've never walked away from it like he has done. It is true. The reason I got in the race is when those people, close your eyes, remember what those people look like coming out of the fields carrying torches, their veins bulging, spewing, just spewing anti-Semitic bile and accompanied by the Ku Klux Klan. A young woman got killed. And they asked the president what he thought. He said there were very fine people on both sides. No president has ever Finish said anything thing. like that. Finish it, it, it is this now. Second, minute, sir. Second point I'd make to you is that when Floyd was killed, when Mr. Floyd was killed, there was a peaceful protest in front of the White House. What did he do? He came out of his bunker, had the military do use tear gas on him so he could walk across to a church and hold up a Bible. And then what happened after that? The bishop of that very church said that it was a disgrace. The general who was with him said he only, all he ever wants to do is divide people, not unite people at all. This is a president who has used everything as a dog whistle to try to generate racist hatred, racist division. This is a man who, in fact, you talk about helping African-Americans. One in 1,000 African Americans has been killed because of the coronavirus. And if he doesn't do something quickly, by the end of the year, one in 500 will have been killed. One in 500 African Americans. This man, this man is a, is a savior of African Americans. This man cares at all. This man's done virtually nothing. Look, the fact is that you have to look at what he talks about. You have to look at what he did. And what he did has been disastrous for the African-American community. So, President Trump, you have two minutes. Why should 
Americans trust you over your opponent to deal with racism. You did a crime bill, 1994, where you called them super predators, African Americans, super predators, and they've never sir. forgotten it. They've never forgotten it, Jeff. No, 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 sir, it's his two minutes. So you did that, and they call you a super predator, and I'm letting people out of jail now that you have treated the African American population community, you have treated the black community about as bad as anybody in this country. You did the 19, and that's why, if you look at the polls, I'm doing better than any Republican has done in a long time, because they saw what you did. You call them super predators, and you've called them worse than that, because you look back at your testimony over the years, you've called them a lot worse than that, as far as the church is concerned, and as far as the generals are concerned. We just got the support of 200, 250 military leaders and generals, total support. Law enforcement, almost every law enforcement group in the United States. I have Florida, I have Texas, I have Ohio, I have, every, excuse me, Portland. The sheriff just came out today and he said, I support President Trump. I don't think you have any law enforcement. You can't even say the word law enforcement because if you say those words, you're gonna lose all of your radical left supporters. And why aren't you saying those words, Joe? Why don't you say the words law enforcement? Because you know what? If they called us in Portland, we would put out that fire in a half an hour, but they won't do it because they're run by radical left Democrats. If you look at Chicago, if you look at any place you want to look, Seattle, they heard we were coming in the following day and they put up their hands and we got back Seattle. Minneapolis, we got it back, Joe, because we believe in law and order, but you don't. The top 10 cities and just about the top 40 cities are run by Democrats and in many cases, radical left. And they've got you wrapped around their finger, Joe, to a point where you don't want to say anything about law and order. And I'll tell you what, the people of this country want and demand law and order, and you're afraid to even say it. All right. I want, to, I want to return to the question of race. Vice President Biden, after the grand jury in the Breonna Taylor case, decided not to charge any of the police with homicide. You said it raises the question, quote, whether justice could be equally applied in America. Do you believe that there is a separate but unequal system of justice for blacks in this country? Yes, there is a systemic injustice in this country, in education, in work, and in, in law enforcement, and in the, in the way in which it's enforced. But look, the vast majority of police officers are good, decent, honorable men and women. They risk their lives every day to take care of us. But there are some bad apples. And when they occur, when they find them, they have to be sorted out. They have to be held accountable. They have to be held accountable. And what I'm going to do as President of the United States is call a, a, together an entire group of people at the White House, well, everything from the civil rights groups to the police officers, the police chiefs, and we're going to work this out. We're going to work this out so we change the way in which we have more transparency in when these things happen. These cops aren't happy to see what happened to, to, to George Floyd. These cops aren't happy to see what happened to Breonna Taylor. Most don't like it, but we have to have a system where people are held accountable. When, and by the way, violence and response is never appropriate. Never appropriate. Peaceful protest is. Violence is never appropriate. All right, what is peaceful Trump, protest? When they run through the middle President, of the town President Trump, and burn down President your stores Trump, and kill people all over Trump, the place? That is not peaceful. peaceful President Trump, no, it's I'm not, not asking. But you say it is. President, President Trump, Trump I'd like to continue with yes, the issue right, of race. Thanks. I promise we're going to get to the issue of law and order Please. in a moment. Please. This month, your administration uh, directed federal agencies to end racial sensitivity training that addresses white privilege or critical race theory. Why did you decide to do that, to end racial sensitivity training? And do you believe that there is systemic racism in this country, sir? I ended it because it's racist. I ended it because a lot of people were complaining that they were asked to do things that were absolutely insane, that it was a radical a revolution that was taking place in our military, uh, in our schools, all over the place, and you know it, and so does what, everybody what, what else. Radical, and he would know. What is oh, radical totally about racist. racial sensitivity training? If you were a certain person, you had no status in life. It was sort of a reversal. And if you look at the people, we were paying people hundreds of thousands of dollars to teach very bad ideas and, frankly, very sick ideas. And, and really, they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to allow that to happen. 
We have to go back to the core values of this country. They were teaching people that our country is a horrible place, it's a racist place, and they were teaching people to hate our country. And I'm no not going to allow that to happen. Vice President Biden? Nobody's doing that. He's just, he's oh, racist. You, you just don't Here's know. the deal. I, I know a lot more about you this. Don't, don't, let him finish. The fact is that there is racial insensitivity. People have to be made aware of what other people feel like, what, if, what, what insults them, what is demeaning to them. It's important that people know they don't want to. Many people don't want to hurt other people's feelings, but it's a, it makes a big difference. It makes a gigantic difference in the way a child is able to grow up and have a, self, a sense of self-esteem. It's a little bit like how this guy and, and his friends look down on so many people. They look down their nose on people like Irish Catholics like me and grew up in Scranton. They look down on people who don't have money. They look down on people who are of a different faith. They look down on people who are a different color. In fact, we're all Americans. The only way we're going to bring this country together is bring everybody together. There's nothing we cannot do if we do it together. We can take this on and we can defeat racism Vice in America. President, I mean, President Trump, sir. During the Obama-Biden administration, there was tremendous division. There was hatred. You look at uh, Ferguson. You look at... You go to very many places. Look at Oakland. Look what happened in Oakland. Look what happened in Baltimore. Look what happened. On, frankly, it was more violent than what I'm even seeing now. Oh but Lord. the reason is, is that ridiculous. the Democrats that Absolutely run these cities ridiculous. don't want to talk like you about law and order. Violent and you crime. still haven't mentioned. Violent Are you crime. in favor of law and order? I'm in favor of law. You follow Are you in favor of law and order? Go ahead. You ask a question, let him finish. Law and order. Law and order. Law and order with justice where people people get treated fairly. And the fact of the matter is violent crime went down 17%, 15% in our administration. All right. It's gone up on his watch. Went down he, much more he, he than had, ours. All right, we're, we're down. Mr. President, you're going to... Mr. President, you're going to... Mr. Mr. President, you're, every record in the Mr. Mr. President, you're going to be very happy because we're now going to talk about law and order. Because we had trouble with Democratic-run cities. That's exactly my Democratic question. There has been a dramatic increase in homicides in America this summer particularly, and you often blame that on Democratic mayors and Democratic governors, but in fact there have been equivalent spikes in Republican-led cities like Tulsa and Fort Worth. So the question is, is this really a party issue? I think it's a party issue. You can bring in a couple of examples, but if you look at Chicago, what's going on in Chicago, where 53 people were shot and eight died shot. If you look at New York, where it's going up like nobody's ever seen anything, the numbers are going up 100, 150, 200 percent uh, crime. It's, it is cities. crazy what's going on. Republic. And he doesn't want to say law and order because he can't, because he'll lose his radical left supporters. And once he does that, it's over with. But if he ever got to run this country and they ran it the way he would want to run it, we would have we would our suburbs would be gone. By the suburbs. way, our suburbs would be gone, and you would see problems like you never would know a suburb unless he took a wrong turn. Oh, I know suburbs. He would not. I was raised what? in the suburbs. This is not 1950. All these dog whistles on racism don't work anymore. Suburbs are by and large integrated. There's many people today driving their kids to soccer practice and or to uh, black and white and Hispanic in the same car as there have been any time in, in the past. What's, what really is a threat to the suburbs? and their safety is his failure to deal with COVID. They're dying in the suburbs. His failure to deal with the environment. They're being flooded. They're being burned out because okay. he has refusal to do anything. That's why the suburbs are in trouble. I, I do want to talk about this issue of law and order, though. And in the joint recommendation that came from the Biden-Bernie Sanders task force, you talked about, quote, reimagining policing. First of all, what does reimagining policing mean, and do you support? It means. Uh, uh, let me, if I might finish the question. What does reimagining policing mean, and do you support the Black Lives Matter uh, call for uh, for community control of policing? Look, what I support is the police having the opportunity to deal with the problems they face. And I'm, not, I'm totally opposed to defunding the police officers. As a matter of fact, police, local police, 
The only one defunding and his budget calls for a $400 million cut in local law enforcement assistance. They need more assistance. They need when they show up for a 9-11 call to have someone with them as a psychologist or psychiatrist to keep them from having to use force and be able to talk people down. We have to have community policing like we had before where the officers get to know the people in the communities. That's when crime went down. It didn't go up. It went down. And so we have to be engaged. That's not what they're service. talking about, that's Chris. That's well, not what that, they're talking about. He's talking exactly, about defunding the that, police. That is not true. He doesn't have any but, law for you. He has no law enforcement That's not support. true. Almost that's nothing. Not, that, look. Oh, really? Who do you have? Name one group that supports you. Name one group that came out and supported you. Go look, ahead. Look, Think. We have time. We don't have time to do no, anything. No, All right. Uh, no, All name right, one folks, law enforcement folks. group. That came well, I out think, and I think, gentlemen, I think I'm going to I'm going to take back the there bottom line as well, and I, want, and I want to get to another subject, which is the issue of protests in many cities that have turned violent. In Portland, Oregon, especially, we had a, more than a hundred straight days of protests, which I think you would agree. You talk about peaceful protests. Many of those turned into riots. Mr. Vice President, you say that people who commit crimes should be held accountable. The question I have, though, is as the Democratic nominee, and earlier tonight you said that you are the Democratic Party right now, have you ever called the Democratic mayor of Portland or the Democratic governor of Oregon and said, hey, you got to stop this, bring in the National Guard, do whatever it takes, but you stop the days and months of violence in Portland? I don't hold public office now. I am a former vice president. I've made it clear I've made it clear in my public statements that the violence should be prosecuted. It should be prosecuted. And anyone who commits it but should be prosecuted. But you've never called for the people, that's the said. leader, excuse me, sir. You have never called for the leaders in Portland and in Oregon to call us, bring in the National Guard and knock well, off a hundred days of riots. They can, in fact, take care of it if he just stay out of the way. Oh, Look, here, oh really? Here, oh, really? Here's the thing. No, I sent sorry, in the no, wait, U.S. I asked to get the killer no, of a yes, young yes, man yes. in the middle of the street, and they shot him. Right. And for three yes, days, President Trump, 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 the U.S. Marshals to take care of business. Go ahead, sir. And by the way, you know, his own former spokesperson said, you know, riots and chaos and violence help his cause. That's what this is all about. I don't know who said that. I do. Who? I think who? It, Kellyanne Conway. I don't think she said that. She said that. And so here's the, all right. well, here's the point. The Go point ahead. is that that's what he is keeps trying to rile everything up. He doesn't want to calm things down. Instead of going in and talking to people and saying, let's get everybody together, figure out how to deal with this. What's he do? He just pours gasoline in the fire constantly and every single solitary okay, time. Okay, and, and to end this, button up this segment, I'm going to give you a minute to answer, sir. You have repeatedly Wait, criticized... I have to answer his statement. No, you have his repeatedly... Statement? Wait, you have repeat, no, second. you've been talking you back made and a forth. statement. I'm asking you... I would love to end it. I would love to end it. You know, if you want to switch seats... We, we could very quickly. We can do that, but I'm saying no, the National I'm, Guard would be over. There'd be no problem. Okay. But they don't want to accept the National Guard. You have repeatedly we, criticized the, the vice president for not specifically calling out Antifa and other left wing extremist right. groups. But are you willing tonight to condemn white supremacists and militia groups sure. and to say that they need to stand down and not? add to the violence in a number of these cities, as we saw in Kenosha, and as we've seen in Portland. Sure, Are you I'm prepared to, to specifically do, do it? Well, I, would ahead, say, I would say almost everything I see is from the left wing, not from the right wing. So what are you, what are you, you, look, what are you saying? I'm, I'm willing to do anything. I want to see well, peace. Then do it, sir. Say I'm, it. Do it. Say it. You want to call them? What do you want to call them? Give me a name. Give me a white name. White supremacists and right like me to condemn White supremacists and right supremacists. Stand back and stand by, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, somebody's got to do something about Antifa and the left, because this is not a right-wing problem, this is, this is a left-wing This is a left-wing problem. White supremacist, Antifa's an idea, not an organization. Oh, you got it. Not malicious. That's what his FBI his okay. FBI director Gentlemen, said. Well, then, you know what? No, no, no we're, done, we're done, sir. Everybody, we're moving on to the next. We're moving on to the next. your administration. That's not an idea. Everybody in your administration bad. tells you the truth is a bad, a bad idea. Can I tell you what? You have no idea. Antifa, Antifa is a dangerous radical All right, radical gentlemen, group. we're now moving on to the Trump and, and Biden records. They'll overthrow you. When a president, I'm going to ask a question. When the president seeks a second term, 
it is generally a referendum on his record. But Vice President Biden, you like to quote one of your dad's sayings, which is don't compare me to the almighty, compare me to the alternative. And in this case, sir, you are the alternative. Looking at both of your records, I'm going to ask each of you, why should voters elect you president over your opponent in this segment? President Trump, you go first two minutes. Because there has never been an administration or president who has done more than I've done in a period of three and a half years. And that's despite the impeachment hoax. And you saw what happened today with Hillary Clinton, where it was a whole big con job. But despite going through all of these things where I had to fight both flanks and behind me and, and above, there has never been an administration that's done what I've done. The greatest, before COVID came in, the greatest economy in history, lowest unemployment numbers. Everything was good. Everything was going. And by the way, there was unity going to happen. People were calling me for the first time in years. They were calling and they were saying, it's time maybe. And then what happened? We got hit, but now we're building it back up again. A rebuilding of the military, including Space Force and all of the other things. A, a fixing of the, the VA, which was a mess under him. 308,000 people died because they didn't have proper health care. He, he was a mess. And we now got a 91% approval rating at the VA, our vets. We take care of our vets. But we've rebuilt our military. The job that we've done, and, and I'll tell you something, some people say maybe the most important. By the end of the first term, I'll have approximately 300 federal judges and court of appeals judges, 300, and hopefully three great Supreme Court judges, justices. That is a record, the likes of which very few people, and you know one of the reasons I'll have so many judges? Because President Obama and him left me 128 judges to fill. When you leave office, you don't leave any judges. That's like, you just don't do that. They left 128 openings, and if I were a member of his party, because they have a little different philosophy, I'd say if you left us 128 openings, you can't be a good president, you can't be a good vice president, but I want to thank you because it gives us almost, it'll probably be above that number by the end of this term, I'm sorry. 300 judges, it's a record. Looking at both your records, why should voters elect you president as opposed to President Under Trump? You have president, two minutes uninterrupted. Under this president, we become weaker, sicker, poorer, more divided, and more violent. When I was vice president, we inherited a recession. I was asked to fix it. I did. We left him a booming economy, and he caused the recession with regard to being weaker. The fact is that I've gone head to head with Putin and made it clear to him we're not going to take any of his stuff. He's Putin's puppy. He still refuses to even say anything to Putin about the bounty on the heads of American soldiers. Your son got no, three no, no. million dollars. A, and by the way, Mr. Mr. Pres my son. Mr. Wait a minute. Mr. President, your campaign agreed that both sides would get two minute answers uninterrupted. Well, your, your side agreed to it. And why don't you observe what your campaign agreed to as a ground rule, okay, sir? He never keeps his word. Can you no, back, no, no, He's I'm not asking. That, that was a rhetorical on. question. Can you go ahead, back sir. 30 seconds? Yeah, yeah, yes, you may have. All right. Go ahead. So, thirdly, we're poor. The billionaires have gotten much, much more wealthy by a tune of over four, three to $400 billion more just since COVID. You in the home, you got less. You're in more trouble than you were before. In terms of being more violent, when we were in office, there were 15% less violence in America than there is today. He's president of the United States. It's on his watch. And with regard to more divided, the nation can't stay divided. We can't be this way. And speaking of my son, the way you talk about the military, the way you talk about them being losers and, being, and, 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 and just being suckers, my son was in Iraq. He spent a year there. He got, the, he got the Bronze Star. He got the Conspicuous Service Medal. He was not a loser. He was a patriot. And the people left behind okay. there were heroes. Really? And I resent you talking about Hunter? Hunter? Are you talking I'm about Hunter? I'm talking about my son, Bo Biden. You're talking I don't about know. I don't know, Bo. I know Hunter. Yeah, Hunter, got know, thrown, Hunter got thrown out of the military. He was thrown out, dishonorably discharged. That's not true. It wasn't dishonorably use. And he didn't have a job until you became vice president. Once you None became of that vice president, true. he made a fortune in Ukraine, in China, in Moscow, that is simply and various not other places. True. 
He my made son, a fortune. Gentlemen, my son. And he didn't have a job. My son, like a lot of people, like a lot of people we know at home, had a drug problem. He's overtaken it. He's, he's, he's fixed it. He's worked on it. And I'm proud of him. But why I'm was he giving tens son. of millions All right, of dollars? He wasn't giving right, tens of millions of That is totally, that's a totally discredited. You've already, this, we've already been to, totally we've already discredited. We've, both, we've already been through this. I think the American people would rather hear about more substantial so subjects. Well, you know, as the moderator, sir, I'm going to make a, know, a judgment call here. Three and a half million okay, dollars right. from the mayor of Moscow. Let's talk about it. That, that, that report is totally Why discredited. I, I, I Mitt Romney on that committee said it wasn't worth taxpayers' that, money, that report. It was written for political you, reasons. You know, I'd like to talk about climate change. So would I. Okay. The forest fires in the West are raging now. They have burned millions of acres. They have displaced hundreds of thousands of people. When state officials there blame the fires on climate change, Mr. President, you said, I don't think the science knows. Over your four years, you have pulled the U.S. out of the Paris Climate Accord. You have rolled back a number of Obama environmental records. What do you believe about the science of climate change and what will you do in the next four years to confront it? I want crystal clean water and air. I want beautiful clean air. We have now the lowest carbon. If you look at our numbers right now, we are doing phenomenally. But I haven't destroyed our businesses. Our businesses aren't put out of commission. If you look at the Paris Accord, it was a disaster from our standpoint. And people are actually very happy about what's going on because our businesses are doing well. As far as the fires are concerned, you need forest management in addition to everything else. The forest floors are loaded up with trees, dead trees that are years old and they're like tinder and leaves and everything else. You drop a cigarette in there, the whole forest burns down. You've got to have forest management. What do you, You've believe, got to have cuts. What do you believe about the science of climate change, sir? Uh, I believe that we have to do everything we can to have immaculate air, immaculate water, and do whatever else we can that's good. You know, we're planting a billion trees, the Billion Tree Project, and it's very exciting. Do you believe for a lot that, of that human pollution, gas, greenhouse gas emissions contributes to the global warming of the planet? I think planet? a lot of things do, but I think to an extent, yes. I think to an extent, yes. But I also think we have to do better management of our forests. Every year, I get the call. California is burning. California is burning. If that was clean, if that were, if you had forest management, good forest management, you wouldn't be getting those calls. You know, in Europe, they live their forest cities. They're called forest cities. They maintain their forests. They manage their forests. I was with the head of a major country. It's a forest city. He said, sir, we have trees that are far more, they, they ignite much easier than California. There shouldn't be that problem. I spoke with the governor about it. I'm getting along very well with the governor. But I said, you know, at some point, you can't every year have hundreds of thousands of acres of land just burned to the ground. But sir, That's but burning down because of a lack of But management. sir, if you believe in the science of climate change, why have you rolled back the Obama clean power plan, which limited carbon emissions in power plants. Why have you relaxed? Because it was driving energy prices through the sky. Why have you relaxed fuel economy standards that are going to create more pollution from cars? Well, than not products? really, because what's happening is the car is much less expensive and it's a much safer car. And you're talking about a tiny difference. And then what would happen because of the cost of the car, you would have at least double and triple the number of cars purchased. We have the old slugs out there that are 10, 12 years old. If you did that, the car would be safer. It would be much cheaper by $3,500. But $3, in the would no, take a lot of cars off the market because people would be able to afford a car. Now, so, and by the way, we're going to see how that turns out. But a lot of people agree with me, many people. The car has gotten so expensive because they have computers all over the place for an extra little bit Okay. Of gasoline. And, but, not, and, and and I'm okay with electric cars, too. I think I'm all for electric cars. I've given big incentives for electric cars. But what they've done in California is just crazy. Right. Vice President Biden, I'd like you to, to respond to the president's climate change record. But I also want to ask you about a concern. You proposed $2 trillion in green jobs. You talk about new limits, not abolishing, but new limits on fracking, ending the use of fossil fuels to generate electricity by 2035, and zero net emission of greenhouse gases by 2050. 
The president says a lot of these things would tank the economy and cost millions of jobs. He's absolutely wrong, number one. Number two, if in fact, when, when our, during our administration, the Recovery Act, I was able to, I was in charge, able to bring down the cost of renewable energy to cheaper than or as cheap as coal and gas and oil. Nobody's going to build another uh, uh, coal-fired plant in America. No one's going to build another oil-fired plant in America. They're going to move to renewable energy, number one. Number two, we're going to make sure that we are able to take the federal fleet and turn it into a fleet that's run on their electric vehicles, making sure that we can do that. We're going to put 500,000 charging stations and all of the highways that we're going to be building in the future. We're going to build an economy that, in fact, is going to provide for the ability of us to take 4 million buildings and make sure that they, in fact, are weatherized in a way that, in fact, will, they'll, they'll emit significantly less gas and oil because the heat will not be going out. There's so many things that we can do now to create thousands and thousands of jobs. We can get to net zero in terms of energy production by 2035, not only not costing people jobs, creating jobs, creating millions of good paying jobs, not 15 bucks an hour, but prevailing wage by having a new infrastructure that in fact is green. And the first thing I will do, I will rejoin the Paris Accord. I will join the Paris Accord because with us out of it, look what's happening. It's all falling apart. And talk about someone who has no, no relationship to, with foreign policy. Brazil, the rainforests of Brazil are being torn down, are being ripped down. More, more carbon is absorbed in that rainforest than every bit of carbon that's emitted in the United States. Instead of doing something about that, I would be gathering up and making sure we had the, com the countries of the world coming up with $20 billion say, here's $20 billion. Stop, stop tearing down the forest. And if you don't, then you're going to have significant economic consequences. What about, consequences. What about the argument that President Trump basically says that you have to balance environmental interests and economic interests, and he's drawn his line? Well, he hadn't drawn a line. He still, for example, makes sure that we, he wants to make sure that methane's not a problem. We can, you, you can now emit more methane without it being a problem. Methane. This is a guy who says that you don't have to have mileage standards for automobiles that exist now. This is a guy who says that, well, the fact that no, it, 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 it's all true. And here's You're the talking deal. about the Green New Deal, and it's not $2 billion I'm, or $20 billion, as you said. I'm, it's $100 trillion. I'm talking about Where they want to rip down the buildings and, no, and rebuild the building. No, it's the dumbest, not, most ridiculous, is not, where airplanes are out of business, that's where that's two car systems are out, where not they want true. to take out the cows. Too. Not, you know, that's true. not true either, right? Not this true. is a this is a one hundred trillion that's more money than that our country true. could make in a hundred years if we're not like the case. All right, let me let me, let me let me let me let me destroy because, our because I actually wait a minute, sir. I actually <laughs> have studied your plan and it includes upgrading four million buildings, weatherizing yes. two million homes over four years, building one and a half million energy efficient homes. So the question becomes, some, the president is saying, I think some people who support the president would say that sounds like it's going to cost a lot of money and hurt the economy. What it's going to do is going to create thousands and millions of jobs, good paying jobs. Well, let him finish, sir. He doesn't know how to do that. $100 they, billion. Dollars. The fact is it's going to create millions of good paying jobs and these tax incentives to people, for people to weatherize, which he wants to get, get rid of. It's going to make the economy much safer. Look how much we're paying now to deal with the hurricanes. With the deal with, by the way, he has an answer for hurricanes. He said maybe we should drop a nuclear weapon on them. They may. I never said that. I said he did say made it up. Uh, and here's the deal. You make up. A we we are going to be in a position where we can create hard, hard, good jobs by making sure the environment is clean and we all are in better shape. We spend billions of dollars now. Billions of dollars on floods, hurricanes, rising seas. We're in real trouble. Look what's happening just in the Midwest with these storms that come through and wipe out entire sections and counties in Iowa. They didn't happen before. They're because of global warming. We make up 15% of the world's problem. We, in fact, but the rest of the world, we've got to get them to come along. That's what we have to get back into, back into 
the Paris Accord. All right, gentlemen. Wait a minute, Chris. So why didn't he do it for 47 years? You were vice president. Why didn't you get the world? China sends up real dirt into the air. Russia does, India does, they all do. We're supposed to be good. And by the way, he made a couple of statements. The Green New Deal is a hundred trillion dollars. That is not, not my billion. plan. That's the Green uh, well, New Deal. Well, we want to rebuild every is not my plan. I want to rebuild right, every new anything to, wait, about. Wait, wait, wait. If you gentlemen, gentlemen, he made gentlemen, a statement gentlemen. about the military. He said I said something about the military. He and his friends made it up, and then they went with it. I never said it. Okay, that is what he true. did. Sir, you said a segment. He called Mr. the Vice, military Mr. Vice stupid President. bastards. I, I he said it on tape. Mr. He said Mr. stupid Mr. bastards. Mr. Please, Mr. Please, stop. I would never I say would that. Play stop. It. Play it. Go ahead, Mr. You're Vice President. Uh, answered his his final question. The final question is I can't remember which of all his ranting. <laughs> <you know, laughs> I'm having a little trouble, little trouble myself, but uh, and, and about the economy and about this question of what it's going to cost. The, the, economy, the economy. I mean, the Green New Deal the, and the idea the, of what what the, your the environmental changes deal, will do. The Green New Deal will pay for itself as we move forward. You're not going to build plants that, in fact, are great polluting plants. But you You're support build the Green New Deal. Pardon me. You support? That? No, I don't support the Green oh, New Deal. Oh, you don't? Oh, well, that's a big that. statement. I support the, you plan. Just the radical left. I, su Man. I support oh, the don't. Biden plan that I put forward. Okay. The Biden plan, which is different than what he calls the radical Green New Deal. All right, gentlemen, final segment, election integrity. As we meet tonight, millions of Americans are receiving mail-in ballots or going to vote early. How confident? Should we be that this will be a fair election? And what are you prepared to do over the next five plus weeks? Because it'll not only be to election day, but also counting some ballots, mail in ballots after election day. What are you prepared to do to reassure the American people that the next president will be the legitimate winner of this election in this final segment? Mr. Vice President, you go first. Prepared to let people vote. We should go to IWillVote.com decide how they're going to vote, when they're going to vote, and what means by which they're going to vote. His own Homeland Security Director, as well as the FBI Director, says there is no evidence at all that mail-in ballots are a source of, of being manipulated and cheating. They said that. The fact is that there are going to be millions of people because of COVID that are going to be voting by mail-in ballots, like he does, by the way. He sits behind the Resolute Desk and sends his ballot to Florida, number one. Number two, we're going to make sure that those people who want to vote in person are able to vote because enough poll watchers are there to make sure they can socially distance. The polls are open on time, and their polls stay open until the votes are counted. And this is all about trying to dissuade people from voting because he's trying to, con to, to scare people into thinking that it's not going to be legitimate. Show up and vote. You will determine the outcome of this election. Vote, vote, vote. If you're able to vote early in your state, vote early. If you're able to vote in person, vote in person. Vote whatever way is the best way for you because you will, he cannot stop you from being able to determine the outcome of this election. And in terms of whether or not when the votes are counted and they're all counted, that will be accepted. If I win, that will be accepted. If I lose, it'll be accepted. But by the way, if in fact he says he's not sure what he's going to accept, well, let me tell you something. It doesn't matter because if we get the votes, it's going to be all over. He's going to go. He can't stay in power. It won't happen. It won't happen. So vote. Just make sure you understand you have it in your control to determine what this country is going to look like the next four years. Is it going to change? You get four more years of these lies. Mr. President, two minutes. So when I listened to Joe talking about a transition, uh, there's been no transition from what I won. I won that election. And if you look at crooked Hillary Clinton, if you look at all of the different people, uh, there was no transition because they came after me trying to do a coup. They came after me spying on my campaign. They started from the day I won and even before I won, from the day I came down the escalator with our first lady. They were a disaster. They were a disgrace to our country. And we've caught them. We've caught them all. We've got it all on tape. We've caught them all. And by the way, you gave the idea for the Logan Act against General Flynn. You better take a look at that because we caught you in a sense. And President Obama was sitting in the office. He knew about it too. So don't tell me about a free transition. As far as the ballots are concerned, it's a disaster. A solicited ballot, okay, solicited is okay. You're soliciting, you're asking, they send it back, you send it back. 
I did that. If you have an unsolicited, they're sending millions of ballots all over the country. There's fraud. They found them in creeks. They found some with the name Trump. Just happened to have the name Trump just the other day in a waste paper basket. They're being sent all over the place. They sent two in a Democrat area. They sent out a thousand ballots. Everybody got two ballots. This is going to be a fraud like you've never seen. The other thing, it's nice on November 3rd, you're watching and you see who won the election. And I think we're going to do well because people are really happy with the job we've done. But you know what? We won't know. We might not know for months because these ballots are going to be all over. Take a look at what happened in Manhattan. Take a look at what happened in New Jersey. Take a look at what happened in Virginia and other places. They're not losing 2%, 1%, which, by the way, is too much. An election could be won or lost with that. They're losing 30 and 40%. It's a fraud, and it's a shame. And can you imagine where they say uh, you have to have your ballot in by November 10th? November 10th. That means that's seven days after the election, in theory, should have been announced. Okay. We have major that's, states no, with that. Sir, All run by Democrats. Two minutes. Two minutes. All run you're, by you're, Democrats. It's President a Trump, it's a I, 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 you're going to be able to continue. You have been charging for months that mail-in balloting is going to be a disaster. You say it's rigged, yes. that it's going to lead to fraud. But in 2018, in the last midterm election, 31 million people voted mail-in voting. That was a quarter, more than a quarter, of all the voters that year cast their ballots by mail. Now that millions of mail-in ballots have gone out, what are you going to do about it? And are you counting on the Supreme Court, including a Justice Barrett, to settle any dispute? Yeah, I, th I think we're counting on them to look at the ballots, definitely. I don't think, well, I hope we don't need them in terms of the election itself. But for the ballots, I think so. Because what's happening is incredible. I just heard, I read today, where at least 1% of the ballots for 2016 were invalidated. They they take them. We don't like them. We don't like them. They throw them out. About if there are millions of ballots going out. What right you do now, is you go and vote. You do a solicited ballot. No, no, and that's I'm okay. Not, or you go and vote. I'm asking you about the fact that millions of people. You go and vote. Seen. You go and no, vote like I'm they, saying, like like they used to. The in the old, millions of people. You either do, Chris, a solicited ballot where you're sending it in. They're sending it back, and you're sending. They have mailmen with lots of it. Did you see what's going on? Take a look at West Virginia mailmen selling the ballots. They're being sold. They're being dumped in rivers. This is a horrible thing for our country. There is no, this is not. There is no. This is not going to end well. There is okay. no this is that. not going Vice to President end well. Five states fact, had mail-in ballots for the last decade or more. Five, including two Republican states. And you don't have to solicit the ballot. It's sent to you. It's sent to your home. What we're saying is, they're saying is that it has to be a postmark by the time by election day. If it doesn't get in till the 7th, 8th, ninth, it still should be counted. He's just afraid of counting the votes. Because You're wrong. You're wrong. I, I, no, I, I want to votes. continue with you on I this. I love Vice that. President Biden. Chris, he's so wrong in, when he makes his statement no, like that. Excuse me. Vice President Biden, the biggest problem, in fact, over the years with mail-in voting has not been fraud historically. It has been that sizable numbers, sometimes hundreds of thousands of ballots are thrown out because they have not been properly filled out or there is some other irregularity or they missed the fraud. deadline. So the question I have is, are you concerned that the Supreme Court with a Justice Barrett will settle any dispute? I am concerned that any court would settle this because here's the deal. When you, when you file, when you get a ballot and you fill it out, you're supposed to have an affidavit. If you didn't know, you have someone say that this is me. You should be able to, if in fact you can verify that you, when the before the ballot is thrown out, that's sufficient to be able to count the ballot because someone made a mistake and not dotting the correct I. Who they voted for, testify, say who they voted for, say it's you. That is totally legitimate. All right. Excuse me. No, no, no. When you I have, have a final, 80 million I, ballots, I have a final Senate question. is swamping I, I, the system. I, you, 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 you know it can't be done. You know it can't. And already it's right. been so so now it mail sir. Final, final, wait a minute, gentlemen. Final million question is, in eight ballots. states, we can keep talking. It's, it's, in eight it's, states, it's election workers are sure. prohibited, currently by law, eight states, from even beginning to process ballots, even take them out of the envelopes and yes. flatten them until election day. That means that it's likely, because there's going to be a huge increase 
in mail-in balloting that we are not going to know on election night who the winner is, that it could be days, it could be weeks, could be months. until we find out who the, the, the new president is. So I, first for you, sir, finally, for the, for the vice president, I hope neither of you will interrupt the other. Will you urge your supporters to stay calm during this extended period, not to engage in any civil unrest? And will you pledge tonight that you will not declare victory until the election has been independently certified? President Trump, I'm you go urging first. my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully because that's what has to happen. I am urging them to do it. As you know, today there was a big problem. In Philadelphia, they went in to watch. They were they're called poll watchers, a very safe, very nice thing. They were thrown out. They weren't allowed to watch. You know why? Because bad things happen in Philadelphia, bad things. And Are I you, am urging, I am urging my people. I hope it's going to be a fair election. If it's a fair election, I am 100% on board. But if I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that. And I'll tell you what, from a common sense, I'll tell you what it means. It means screen. you have a fraudulent election. You're and sending out you 80 do? million ballots. They're not, they're not equipped to, these people aren't equipped to handle it, number one. Number two, okay. they cheat. They cheat. Hey, they found ballots in a waste paper basket three no. days ago, and they all had the name right. military ballots. They were military. They all had the name Trump on them. Vice President you think Biden, that's good? Vice President Biden, final question for you. Will you urge your supporters to stay calm while the vote is counted? And will you pledge not to declare victory until the election is independently certified? Yes. And here's the deal. They count the ballots, as you pointed out. Some of these ballots in some states can't even be opened until election day. And if there's thousands of ballots, it's going to take time to do it. And by the way, our military, they've been voting by ballots for since the end of the Civil War, in effect. And that's, and that's what's happened, going to happen. Why was it not? Why is it for them somehow not fraudulent? It's the same process. It's honest. No one has established at all that there is fraud related to mail-in ballots. That somehow it's a fraudulent process. It's already been established. It's a, take a look at Carolyn Maloney's race. I, 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 I now. You had an opportunity look to respond. Look at Carolyn Maloney. Go ahead. They have no idea what Vice happened. President Biden, go ahead. He has no idea what he's talking about. Here's the deal. The fact is, I will accept it, and he will too. You know why? Because once the winner is declared after all the, all the ballots are counted, all the votes are counted, that'll be the end of it. That'll be the end of it. And if it's me, in fact, fine. If it's, if it's not me, I'll support the outcome. And I'll be a president, not just for the Democrats. I'll be a president for Democrats and Republicans. And this guy, I want to say, honest, honest okay. ballot count. Gentlemen, we you say that's the end of it? This is the I end of this debate. Honest ballot count. We're going to leave it there. Too. Uh, to be continued okay. as in more debates as we go on. Uh, president Trump, Vice President Biden, it's been an interesting hour and a half. I want to thank you both for participating. In the first of three debates that you have agreed to engage in, we want to thank Case Western Reserve University and the Cleveland Clinic for hosting this event. The next debate, sponsored by the Commission on Presidential Debates, will be one week from tomorrow, October 7th, at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. The two vice presidential nominees, Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Kamala Harris, will debate at 9 p.m. Eastern that night. We hope you watch. Until then, thank you and good night. Thank you. And that concludes the first presidential debate.